Coventry Town Council meeting to order on Monday, October 18th, 2021. Yeah. Council members at the table, we have John Hand, Lisa Thomas, our town manager, John Elsesser. I'm Julie Blanchard. This is Matt O'Brien Sr. Joining us through Zoom, we have Richard Williams, Matt O'Brien Jr., Lisa Conant, and our former zoning agent, Mark Landolina, is on the screen. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Now we have a special presentation if Jimmy McLaughlin and Bud Myers want to come forward. At this time, we'd like to invite the awardees into the room for acknowledgement of their life-saving efforts that they've uh, engaged in. Then we'll have some words to speak on behalf of their act, their efforts. Look at a packed house tonight, wow. <laughs> Good evening, uh, members of the town council, town manager and residents of Carpentry. Thank you for having us tonight, our department here, to recognize nine people who on Friday, October 1st, responded to a medical call at 8.12 a.m. The fire department received the emergency call stating that a nine-year-old female was having difficulty breathing. The following responders answered the call, Deputy Chief Vigilia, Lieutenant Alex Bohr, Lieutenant Ron Hodgkins, EMT Linda Hodgkins, EMT Josh McGill, EMT Kelly Phillips, Police Officer Michelle Krukoff, Paramedic Ryan Will, and Paramedic Paul Pichenko. I hope I got that one right. <laughs> Emergency responders were on the scene in five minutes. Upon our arrival, the patient was found lying on a table in the backyard. She was in critical condition and unresponsive. The first responders assessed her condition and began using a bag valve mask with high flow oxygen to perform rescue breathing as she was not effectively breathing on her own. Our patient was moved to a stretcher while artificial respirations were continued by EMS for the du duration of the care. She was transported with the highest priority along with um, Christine, you're, it's a, please it's real, a, Christine. Just north of the Salt Pond Visitor Center. <laughs> um, it turned out to be perfect. Somebody want to run next to where you got it? <laughs> Sorry about Sorry. that. No problem. Technology. Hey, absolutely. Uh, let's see. She was transported with the highest priori priority along with two Wyndham paramedics to Wyndham Hospital. While en route, Chief Vigilia called for LifeStar to transfer the patient to the to, uh, Children's Hospital from Wyndham Hospital. At the time we delivered our patient to the hospital, we were concerned about her outcome. For days following the initial call, we would receive daily updates regarding her condition. On Friday afternoon, she was intubated on life support. On Friday night, she came off ventilator, was breathing on her own. Saturday morning, she was off oxygen and answering questions, but still agitated. I wonder why. <laughs> Sunday, where you're updated, she was making small improvements. On Monday, she was tired but looked good. She was eating and talking, all good signs. On Wednesday, on Wednesday she was discharged from the hospital, sent home to be greeted by emergency vehicles with flashing lights. Because of the quick actions of her dad calling 911 and the efforts of our emergency responders, our nine-year-old patient was a tremendous, has a tremendous future ahead of her. For that, we are grateful. We would like to formally acknowledge those individuals responsible for this great outcome by presenting them each with the Coventry Life Saving Award.
I was going to say for so many days to thank every single person that helped from from my neighbors getting there right away to Lifestar to everyone. I don't know how to thank everybody. There's there's just not words that I can say. Thank you enough for saving my daughter's life. And uh I can't I don't even know if I can say anything else. Can you help me? <laughs> <laughs> So, are there even words to describe, you know, given a chance to keep your child in your life? I don't think so, but everybody is just so far above and beyond um, what you, th you know, you, you already know people are great, but then when something like this happens, you really, the fast response. It's, it's just, there's no words really. We're forever in everybody's debt. Yeah. That goes without saying. And uh, everybody in this town, really, I know you guys were right on point right from the beginning, but everybody else, the entire support system, the whole town, everybody's encouragement and prayers and well wishes, it was amazing. People that we didn't even know that jogged by the house stopped <coughs> and asked if everything was okay. People that don't know us. And the following Saturday, when she was already home, recording I, in progress. I saw a lady run by, and she was smiling from ear to ear and waving, which I already knew what it meant. It meant that she checked up on her, and she wanted to know if she's okay, and she knew she was okay. And in this day and age, with what we're going through, good news is hard to come by. Yeah. And we're grateful that her getting another chance at life is also a chance for all of us to come together as a family as a town we i can love this town this town is amazing i convinced my parents years ago to build here it was the best decision ever and um i will forever call this town home and we're very grateful and anything that we can do to give back to this town we will do that and we will raise our kids to give back to this town as we've always planned to Thank you for Thank everybody. You for
Okay. How many have here for the next group? Uh, we'll let them pull up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Oh, no, thank you. Thank all of them. That was so wonderful. That was wonderful. <laughs> all right. The next portion of our meeting is for audience of citizens. For those of you that wanted to speak, I have a list here that people signed up. So if Brian Murray would go to the podium, state your name and address, please. That's a tough act to follow, though. I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Brian Murray. Um, I'm on 29 Cassidy Hill Road. As a citizen of Coventry, I want to thank you guys for your service to the town, the town council. Uh, what I want to talk about is how the town manages and enforces business permits in this town. Um, the reason I'm here is I attended a, an event this year, this summer, at the Cassidy Hill Vineyard, and what I saw was concerning. I have worked in the property and casualty insurance business for most of my career. <clears throat> What's going on at these events is a liability risk for the town, the winery, and the neighbors. The assembly of over 500 people involving town roads and multiple residential properties creates a unique liability situation for the town. This, this winery business was started in 2006 and issued an indoor event permit. I don't think anybody has any issues with that permit. The issue that we have is the permit that was issued in 2011. The town required as part of that permit for a parking lot, driveway, lighting, ADA compliant handicapped spaces, and porta potties to be brought in because the septic system is only sized for 116 people. This work was never done and the town never followed up on it. Compliance costs money these days but it ensures safety to the community. <clears throat> the, also, the operations at this winery that are out of compliance is their permit was only for 150 people, but they've had an excess of 500. There's never been porta lets on site for a septic system only designed for 116. They've gone over their greater than 15 events, and this whole thing has been going on for 10 years. There's verified police reports of people being so drunk they don't know where they are and they got their keys in their hands. There's also people leaving the winery intoxicated. No one wants this kind of behavior on their street. I've had conversations with Eric Trott, and he says no one notices. He says this is not an issue because he hasn't heard any complaints. There was a police officer on my street on a Friday night investigating a speeding complaint, and I asked him about it, and he said he can't enforce it. The other thing is zoning, I was told by Eric Trott, doesn't work on the weekends. But an on-site visit could confirm that the changes weren't made. At this point, I did a formal complaint to address the liability, safety, and regulatory issues with the town. There was a planning and zoning meeting. Eric Trott did lay out the complaints. The planning and zoning board never asked the Chipkins, why are they out of compliance? The questions from the board centered around why are all these complaints coming in now? If someone like me brings up valid violations, they should not be the one on trial. They should be focused on the violations in the business. After this meeting, and I did some more research, I found that the, that the winery did not issue or submit a final plan to the town, which means by zoning regulations, the outdoor permit's not even valid. I repeat that, there is no active outdoor permit for the vineyard. This outdoor special permit was um, only disclosed by Eric Trott that it wasn't valid after I pushed him on it and did my research and the land use records. He wasted my time, he misled the citizens, the board and the media. This was never stated at the planning and zoning meeting that the permit was not active. Another thing about this is in town, when you have over 300 people, it requires a special permit if you don't have the proper permits. So my calculation, those permits are $50 a permit. He's had 18 events a year times 10 years. That's $9,000 in lost revenue to the town. Recently, after a review, the Board of Health cited them for not having a food service license. 
They ordered a cease and desist op on the operations on serving wine by the glass. The Republican Town Committee had to get a special temporary permit to have their meet and greet event last Friday night. This is on a business that was established in this town in 2006. <clears throat> Around enforcement, I put in a formal complaint, but no zoning enforcement has been done on this business to this date. Eric Trott stated nothing will be done because of an investigation, but it doesn't take too much time to realize that the permit is not active or that there's a parking lot missing. After the town meeting with the Chipkins to talk about the issues they posted on Facebook, they said, due to excessive rainfall, our parking is limited for Friday night music events on September 3rd. We highly recommend carpooling to allow as many people as possible to attend. So after the town meeting, nothing changed. So the bottom line for me is we can't have compl a complaint-based system for all permits, especially businesses serving alcohol in this town. And it shouldn't be 10 years after an issue issuance of a permit that the town manager, the engineer, the police, fire, sanitation, and wetlands occurs. That's 3,652 days after a permit was issued in this town. I'm asking the town to be more proactive with high-risk businesses with large crowds and alcohol. I want to ensure that initial permit conditions are completed. Permits need to be enforced to motivate businesses to comply. And if I, di if I didn't put this formal complaint in, this town would still be exposed today to this. I want to publicly say that I'm not here to shut the winery down. This is not an attack on the Chipkins. I did try to talk to Robert Chipkin before engaging with the town. This in my mind is what gentlemen and good neighbors do. But I now live on a street where harmony has been disrupted and I feel the town is co in the town's conduct has put this all in the citizens. And I hope with the town being active in this manner, it can be restored. I hope when this is behind us, the vineyard has a better, safer environment for its patrons in the neighborhood. I want to thank you for your time. Howard Haberin. I too would like to thank the town council for the time and the town manager. I'm here tonight to speak about how disappointed I am with how the town of Coventry and some people who hold political positions have handled the concerns raised by some neighbors who live on Cassidy Hill Road. This is regarding the Cassidy Hill Winery. The winery has never been in compliance with the town's mandated 2011 11-12S. This non-compliance has been allowed to exist for 10 plus years, allowing the winery to do business with no regard to any regulations, safety concerns, and legal obligations. There's also no final required plan for the permit registered with the country land use records. Thus, as it now stands, there's no permit for the gathering at the winery for outdoor events. I feel with confidence that Eric Trott, Director of Planning and Development, has not been totally transparent with our concerns. I also feel that he gave misleading information when explaining to the press that the Chipkins, they were working with the town, some compliance had been attempted. I also have no confidence of this being done in a timely manner. I previously lived on David Drive in Coventry and waited for more than four years for Mr. Trott to end the illegal operation of my neighbor at that time, who was running a construction company on our cul-de-sac. Well, we moved to Cassidy Hill Road for a better home and gave up hoping that Mr. Trott would correct that problem. We can't afford to uh, move again. <clears throat> I also feel the town has also censored us from addressing our concerns to the zoning board. The last zoning board meeting was canceled, and a previous one ruled out having the problem with the winery on its agenda. This causes me to wonder if because the chickens are running for two different political positions in our town, town council, the zoning board of appeals, that they have the connections to stall out any real progress in, until after the election time. I repeat, I can't prove this, but it does make one wonder. Then we have council member Matt O'Brien Jr. calling us nut jobs. 
And I have a hard copy of him posting this if he wants to deny it. You know, like how he tried to deny at the last town council meeting that he questioned the integrity of the 2020 elections in Coventry. Council member O'Brien Jr., we live on this street and we have the right for the town to enforce regulations that keep us safe from intoxicated drivers speeding down our nearly dim lit roads. You should be ashamed of yourself for calling us nut jobs, and you need to apologize. I feel the council has a responsibility to make sure that this doesn't accelerate into a more dangerous personal situation. My wife and I have already been verbally assaulted when we walked down Cassidy Hill Road. We were told by the Chippen's <coughs> friends, get out of here, leave, go away. Standing on our own road, walking like we normally do. <clears throat> as far as what are some of our concerns, look at how they, if the regulations were done by them, this is how they disregard them anyways. 57 maximum cars allowed, many times over 200. 150 people in attendance, as many as six or 700. Sanitation limits allowed for 116 people, well, that's been exceeded by 500%. Wheel stops, where are they? The gravel access road, I can't see that either. Here's an ironic one, proper lighting, not in place, but I did see the use of a golf cart single headlight being used on the neighbor's lawn for the exiting of cars for those who attended the winery concert. Is that safe? Also, the town requires approved application for license for special events with 300 or more people in attendance. Instead of paying the, five, the $50 fee each time to the town, they didn't pay anything. They owe this money, most likely in the thousands to the town. Are they gonna pay for it now? Who's monitoring the consumption of alcoholic beverages? Why aren't our police in attendance to monitor these alcoholic events and perform proper traffic control? Police records show patrons drunk and not knowing even where they're at. Also, the winery doesn't have a valid food license, but still sold wine by the glass and slushies. This includes that they didn't have the current water analysis test with the state of Connecticut in order to dispense these alcoholic beverages. But, on October 8th, the Eastern Highlands Health District did issue a suspension of them selling those beverages. And they did have to obtain one for their RTC meeting held on October 15th, after they had been caught. Why was the town so vigilant with a lakeside restaurant having to comply when they exceeded their maximum capacity and not the winery? The lakeside had to obtain additional parking to accommodate the number of their customers. Wonder why the Chippians weren't forced to comply. The Chippians still hold Republican RTC events at their winery. <coughs> I hope that their political influence has nothing to do with this, and there's no way of me to prove it, but it definitely is suspicious. The conclusion is, it's time for all members of the town council and town employees who will decide on the outcome of this to do the right thing. Regulate by regulations equally for all businesses. I want my letter to be included into the records, and thank you. Who do I give this to? You can bring it to the end of the table if you like, or whatever. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next on my list is Dorothy Grady. They're on here, so. But okay, you want to state your name and address, yes. even though may it's I on pull my, down my May I pull down my mask? I'm, I'm fully vaccinated and I've told them. Um, my name is Dorothy Grady. I live at 42 Cornwall Drive. And I come before you tonight to talk about two different, very different things. Things have changed in town. <clears throat> Our politics have changed. There was a time when we worked together better for the town of Coventry. And tonight, I'm here to speak about one of the persons who always worked together. And that's Harvey Barrett, who died today. 
Harvey truly exemplified somebody who worked on both sides of the aisle. He was elected and served as both a Democrat and a Republican and did his best for the town. What he cared about was the community. What he cared most about were the sports programs. He was on the original committee for Patriots Park Development, the water ski club and the water ski show. Parks and Rec and the town council were activities that he volunteered for. I want to offer my public condolences to his wife, Marilyn, and his children, Michael and Laura. And I will tell you, in all those years when the Democrats had dances and fundraisers, Harvey and Marilyn were by far the best ballroom dancers in the town of Coventry. And I want to say thank you to Harvey for all he did for our town. The other topic is what happened two weeks ago at the town council meeting, which I was watching at home. Two weeks ago, on October 4th, a citizen stood up during the audience of citizens' time, as allowed, and spoke. But when she took her seat at the town council table, as a member of the town council, another town council member, Richard Williams, with an angry, raised voice, berated her for her comments. When the citizen, Lisa Thomas, tried to respond, another council member, Matt O'Brien, interrupted her and told her to let Richard Williams speak. The exchange was loud, angry, and insulting. Throughout this exchange, Julie said nothing. No one was called order was not called to the table. No one was given the floor. She allowed her Republican town council members to berate this Democrat. No citizen should be treated like this. It was just wrong. And it was embarrassing. And Lisa Thomas deserves an apology. Robin Gallagher. Hi, my name is Robin Gallagher. I live at 984 Main Street. I want to just start off in a manner I wasn't expecting and say that I wasn't anticipating coming to this council meeting and starting to cry. But that young lady who um, was saved went to preschool with my son, and it was very easy for me as a mother to imagine that fear and how she must have felt knowing that her son's or her daughter's life was in danger. And I just want to say we're really blessed to have the first responders that we have and to still have that young lady as part of our community. So, um, and on, <laughs> on a completely different note, um, as uh, you all likely know, I am running for town council and as part of that responsibility, I'm trying to get caught up on issues that are likely to come up over the next two years. One issue I found particularly interesting um, at, and was happy to hear John Elsesser address during the last town council meeting was the issue of moving the transfer station. Moving the transfer station now puts Coventry in an excellent position to get ahead of the curve through creative thinking about municipal solid waste. The waste management industry in Connecticut is undergoing a lot of changes. The uh, Materials and Innovation Recycling Authority, MIRA, which handles approximately 30% of Connecticut's municipal solid waste, is going to shut down its burn plant in Hartford next summer. Right now, it appears that Myra is likely to make up for that by shipping garbage out of state, which I'm sure we can all imagine is much more expensive. Um, while we, as a town, don't deal with Myra uh, directly, um, changing 30% of a market is likely to cause increases across the market. Similarly, the recycling industry is not what it once was. While municipalities used to be paid per ton for recycling that they sent out, or at the very least could recycle for free, now municipalities are being charged to recycle. 
This change is based on a market shift involving contamination levels in Connecticut and across the country, which have increased um, while importers of materials of these recycled or to be recycled products, namely China and India, are demanding cleaner product. In response to these changes, the state DEP has lauded smaller um, operations that increase the availability of composting and think creatively about municipal solid waste. Simultaneously, different entities are looking at how best to divert food waste from the traditional waste stream. Because of these statewide challenges, I think we can safely anticipate changes for municipalities and how they handle their municipal solid waste. Refusal to change and adapt now may make waste management very expensive for our residents in the future. As a, <laughs> as a result, I was very happy to hear Mr. Elsasser talk about some of the ideas and technologies being considered. There's no better time to consider the implementation of new technologies or expansion of existing programs than now when we're talking about moving the transfer station anyway. And that way we can hope to be proactive regarding the changes that are necessarily coming down the pike, sparing our citizens from larger costs to make improvements down the road. Along those lines, um, there was some discussion, I think, about weighing waste. And I was wondering whether it would be like a fee based on weight, the um, weight of the waste. One of the things we need to be careful of, and I know this is something that has been seen nationwide where they charge per the amount of waste, is uh, higher contamination rates as a result. So people who don't have the money to pay for additional trash take that trash and put it in the recycling bin, which increases contamination, which then is a bigger problem overall because it causes municipalities to be um, charged for their recycling. Um, my goal um, is to use creative problem solving to avoid that and any other unintended consequences. And I um, thank you all for your, your thinking on this subject and your time tonight. Next is Caroline Davis. Hi, I'm Caroline Davis, 302 Pine Lake Drive. Um, I guess I can take this off. Um, two weeks ago, I stood here and shared just how deeply insulted I was by Matt O'Brien Jr.'s description of my fellow 2020 Election Day workers and me as, quote, in my opinion, biased people from both parties who were library projects. The day after I spoke, I shared that video to one of the town Facebook pages. The next morning, I was pleasantly surprised to see that Matt Jr. had commented and attached a video response. So I watched it, did some research, and replied. The following day, I went to check my post, and I was stunned to find that our three comments were gone. Just gone. Um, at first, I thought they had been deleted, but then I asked a friend to check it out. And um, Matt, you blocked me? Um, I'm a constituent. I was following up on your response by asking questions and seeking answers and clarification. Instead of doing the job you volunteered for, which absolutely involves engaging with your constituents, you stuffed your fingers in your ears, turned your back on me, and pretended I didn't exist. What an unbelievably immature way for an elected official tasked with helping to run a town to behave in general, never mind towards a constituent. So let's dig into your explanation and my response. You said, quote, there were some issues with different numbers being reported at different times, which caused confusion. And I can certainly outline those if anyone wants to see them, but it's really inconsequential. First of all, they are not inconsequential. They are the crux of your argument. Secondly, when you offered to outline the various reported results, I decided to do my own research in hopes that we could compare notes. So here's what I found. I traced every instance of confusion I could find back to its initial source. And imagine my surprise when I discovered that they all led back to one post. It was a set of unofficial results posted at 10.41 p.m. to the Republican Town Committee Facebook page, which you run. And they were the results that you had come in to take a picture of around 10.30 that night. I know because I was sitting literally right next to you as you took the photos. So as far as some of the RTC followers were aware, a sizable and seemingly unexplained swing in votes took place overnight, leading to the passage of the library referendum they did not support and that they thought had failed. That certainly would seem confusing or suspicious, especially to anyone who was already hesitant to trust the election. 
You knew that a swing in vote totals was likely going to happen, Matt. You also knew that the results you posted were likely going to change. You knew the hand-counted hand counted ballots had not yet been tallied. And by the end of the night, night, you knew there was going to be a recount. But instead of including that context in your post and explaining the change in vote totals to your supporters, you simply described that vote total count as unbelievable and said, quote, we have never seen that in this town ever. It was then that you described the election workers counting those votes as biased and pro-library project. And when asked by a constituent if you or Julie Blanchard could fight the results, you said, we may have to file a lawsuit. By saying that, you both passively encouraged and actively demonstrated your own lack of trust in the election process and our election workers. But hey, the possibility of a lawsuit sounds strong and bold, and it was certainly in step with the wildly fictitious narrative of rampant ballot fraud that was being promoted on a daily basis by elected Republicans all around the country. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. I will not be fooled and I will not be shamed. There was no election irregularities in Coventry that night, and I repeat what I said two weeks ago. I am concerned that despite saying that you trust Coventry's elected workers and that you believe in the integrity of elections in Coventry, your actions show that you have spent five years both subtly and overtly promoting distrust in our elections, seemingly as a way to prevent preemptively explain failure. I also noticed that you failed to acknowledge or address my challenge to you from the previous two weeks ago, so I would like to repeat it again. I ask that you encourage your most skeptical supporters to become election workers. I even took the time to put it together a short script for you because I know you're a busy guy. I firmly believe in the integrity of Coventry's election process and that our election workers are honest and trustworthy. We have had no instances of voting fraud or ballot fraud in Coventry, but if you feel uncomfortable or uncertain about either one, I highly recommend volunteering to work on election day so that you can experience the election process firsthand. Feel free to use it whenever you'd like. Thank you. Mike Shore. Hi, Mike Shore, 47 High Street, SHOR. Um, almost a year and a half ago, as America, or most Americans, reckoned with racial injustice and many humbly looked within to see what they can learn and what they can do to improve our nation, I emailed all of you. I asked what your thoughts were and how you think we can make our community better, how we can make it more accepting, more welcoming, and whether you personally, I asked, were affected by any of these events and if you could share with me how. I want to thank those of you who took the time to respond and to act um, and talk to the four of you that I never heard from. I assumed maybe you were too busy or maybe not every constituent's request is to be taken seriously or maybe you were still trying to clarify your thoughts. But the memo recently signed by all of you who chose not to respond back then made very, very clear why and what your views actually are. In a statement that you could have just as easily written racism and bad is bad and put a period, you chose instead to reintroduce into our local politics every victim-blaming racist trope that study after study has dismissed. You claim that it isn't racism that's responsible for differences, but a lack of hard work. It isn't racism, but the existence of a social safety net. It isn't racism, but single-family homes and moral character. It isn't racism, but it's the breakdown in families. What you did, according to every academic that's ever looked at this, is you basically claim that a fever causes the flu. You got ultimately confused between causes and symptoms, but in the process, you came so dangerously close to parroting the common refrain of white supremacy. If only black people loved their children and weren't so lazy, then everything would be okay. I actually believe what one of you said at the last meeting, that this was not your intent and is merely one interpretation. But I want to implore you to consider that these tropes lead to precisely this interpretation by the very people you claim to care about. But I'm not here to talk to you about your morals and your ethics and your code because that's between you and you. I want to talk to you about how your words hurt the town image and how we hurt it financially. I work at the University of Connecticut. Every time the university hires a new faculty member, an administrator, a coach, a lab director, an entire new family moves to eastern Connecticut and searches for a community to call its own. 
That decision brings to the chosen town property taxes, often pretty high from a successful family, restaurant dollars, other local business dollars, donations to local causes. It raises the financial vibrancy of our town, something I thought is the major issue of four of the members of this committee. Coventry lags most of the communities in this area for movement among new University of Connecticut hires. I have spoken to a number of these families and I want to offer you some quotes about why and how our town is viewed. From a black professor hired last year, I'm not bringing my kid to a town where rallies still have people yelling the N-word with elected officials in attendance. From a young white couple, from what we read in the papers, Coventry's very welcoming if you're Christian and white. Isn't that something one of your town council members said? Another, tell me, how many black families in Coventry stay in town when it's time for their kids to go to high school? I only know one family and I sure as hell know they didn't. These and many stories like it are the impressions that the families that I relate to make when they read about the events of this town in the papers. If you take a look at how this town is viewed when you make the news, that's the reasons you make the news. Perhaps they too are misinterpreting what's in your heart, but perhaps you share some responsibility for not being sufficiently sensitive to how your words impact people and therefore the success of this town. I want to conclude with two quotes by a man who passed away today who isn't some liberal Democrat, as I often hear these issues are, because you know race is a liberal Democrat issue, but Colin Powell had a couple of words that actually seem to relate to the memo that you also authored. He said, first, I became the first black chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the first black Secretary of State because of the many black soldiers and foreign policy specialists who served before me. But because of segregation and racism, they never had the chance for themselves to become the chairman or the secretary. Now, many then said, well, yeah, as your letter suggested, that was a long time ago, 20, 30 years. Clearly, racism has solved itself since then. So let me share what Chairman Powell said two years ago, the same time I emailed you. He said, people who look to me or to President Obama or any other successful black man or woman and misuse our achievement to claim that racism is over or isolated to a few incidents, let me quote that for you again, isolated to a few incidents. Read back to your memo, see the words you have, and realize that Colin Powell was talking to the exact trope that you leveled. So let me finish. That racism is over or is isolated to a few incidents. They do themselves, their heart, and this country a great disservice. So while you might not have meant those words, every person <clears throat> who hears them takes those words to mean this is a town where people of color aren't welcome. And if you are unwilling to accept that that's the meaning that your words have, at least for the sake of the finances of the town, if not for your own internal ethical code, maybe you shouldn't say every thought that appears to you and bring it into our local politics. Thank you for your time. Carolyn Arabolis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening. My name is Carolyn Arabolas, and I live at 132 North Farms Road. I am also the chairwoman of the Coventry Democratic Town Committee. I'm here tonight to recognize and acknowledge the contributions of outgoing councilwoman Lisa Conant and to thank her for her four years of service on the town council. I met Lisa during the 2017 campaign, which for both of us was our first time running for elective office. We soon became friends, and then, of course, council colleagues. I quickly came to respect and admire Lisa for her intelligence, sharp wit, and well-spoken demeanor. It has been abundantly clear in the last four years just how much Councilwoman Conant loves this town. She shows up at events to represent the town with pride and honor. She has dedicated countless hours in preparation for and participation in council and committee meetings, as well as various regional and community forums in which the town of Coventry participates. She keeps herself informed of what's happening in town so that she can speak to what's important to the citizens. In running for office, Lisa has always enjoyed door knocking because she enjoys connecting with the people of this town. 
She deepens her connections at every opportunity to interact with Coventry citizens, including near weekly visits to the Coventry Farmers Market, during cultural events, such as Christmas in the Village and Arts on Main, and even while simply running errands in town. She listens so that she can represent and advocate for the best interests of Coventry and its residents. I speak for myself and for the Coventry DTC when I say directly to Councilwoman Conant, thank you for representing us with dignity and integrity, thank you for your dedication and commitment, and thank you for always putting the needs and well-being of Coventry as a central focus of your work at this table. I will forward this to the audience of citizens email box so that it can be added to the minutes for tonight's meeting. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That's it. Concludes our audience of citizens portion. Next, could I have a motion to accept our minutes from October 4th? Matt Senior. Move to accept the minutes from October 4th. Second. Thank you, John. Any changes, corrections? Lisa? Um, yes. Um, so starting on page two, there are comments um, by Caroline Davis under Audience of Citizens. Matthew O'Brien's name in the first line should be spelled with two T's. Moving down to page three where I was speaking as a private citizen. Uh, I just want to clarify that the resolution condemning racism, no, the resolution condemning anti-Semitism was passed before the memo uh, was sent to steering. But I raised the resolution about anti-Semitism because despite that being passed by this council, I was unable to attend both September town council meetings because of the Jewish High Holy Days. This is relevant because despite my request to Chairperson Blanchard, uh, a vote on the racism resolution was held when I couldn't be present, though it could have waited until the October 4th meeting. Also in um, my comments, I did not say I was raised in a single family home. I specifically said I was raised primarily by my father, which is an important distinction, and I don't think I need to go into further personal details about that. After the first large block of my comments, when I was seated back at the table, one, two, three, four, paragraphs or lines down, sentences down, starts with the word Thomas. Thomas said that the memo contradicts itself. Thomas should be spelled with T-H, please. The next line after that, Han said Lisa are not the only one offended. I think R should be is. On page six of the minutes, the second line <coughs> down, uh, Lisa Conant is speaking, so she can verify this. <coughs> but I believe in the second line on page six, when she talks about grants, it should say, and pass through grants, as opposed to pass due grants. Mm -hmm. On page eight, any instances of the word COVA, about halfway down, item 8E need to be changed to C-O-V-R-R-A. At the bottom of the page, near the bottom, there's a sentence that says, O'Brien Sr. asked how WPCA is doing with gravel. Did they decide to do a second? It, is, it isn't clear to me what he's asking about there. Can you? Uh, clarify that, Matt Senior. They were moving. Uh, actually, John would be better to answer that question if he comes back. Okay. I just don't know what the second. So they, they were emptying. Second is. <laughs> they were emptying one of their uh, places that they keep, you know, the gravel that's being used to um, clear up, to clen cleanse the uh, um, stuff, and they, they were talking about possibly doing a second. That's all. 
I just I think if I'm members sure. of the community want to read it, it's yeah, not, I'm losing the word. It's not evident. But just in the nick of time. John, quick question. Um, yep. When the gravel was moved from WTCA, what was the source? Where did it come from? Uh, it, it is natural, it's native gravel. No, no. Um, what part of the WPCA building, did, where did it come from? It came out of the lagoons. Lagoons, okay. Or and did they decide to do a second what? They were contemplating. They're, they're going to do a second lagoon. You have to actually... A second break. lagoon. Okay, you know, There's just, seven lagoons. That's yeah. okay, you don't have to go first. Just that it's not clear. That's the only the word minutes. that's missing. Just put yeah. the word lagoon there. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Page nine, item 8F1. In the fourth paragraph, Again, not clear if I was a uh, citizen who wanted to read this. I'm sorry, is the fourth pair of the mic or, or the LED? I'm LED lights. Okay. LED lights and or we're going in with us on a trail grant. I think that's two different things being talked about there. I think so, too. Um, yeah. The LED lights are going where? Uh, <laughs> not on Bear Swamp Road. <laughs> but I don't think. We did LED lights in three buildings. Aha! Uh -huh. LED lights have gone into three buildings. And so that's basically, the energy efficiency. Now have them. For energy efficiency, yes. Thank you. Um, so, they're add the so where it says LED lights, that should be maybe its own line. LED lights have gone into additional town buildings for energy efficiency. As long as it's not connected to the trail grant. We're not putting LED lights on no. the trails. Also, no, this is You see the flashing uh, mute symbol next to yeah, Lisa right now? The other TV is on the other one. Okay. Okay. I'm just. Uh. At the bottom of the page in the last paragraph, John Elsesser is speaking. Um, the second sentence We have some project closeout money that we may be able to look, I think the word is at instead of out. Mm -hmm. Sure, page nine. Yep. At the very bottom. And I think in the next sentence, which begins, I think it is a doable project, um, it should say Elsesser thinks it is a doable project. It just There are several times in the minutes where mm -hmm. the minutes move between Elsesser and I. I think it needs to consistently be Elsesser throughout those minutes, and I'll, I'll mention that. Um, it happens again on page 10. So if we go to page 10, the first sentence, Thomas commented that the proposed bike loop is instead of are on dangerous roads. Um, 8F2 under the COVID update, just again, anywhere it says I instead of Elsesser, it should just say Elsesser, so we know who's speaking. Eleven. Um, where I'm speaking again, I say I had not been able to attend the last two town council meetings because they were scheduled on high holy days. The word holy should have just one each. And then um, going down a little bit further where I said that I am not willing to be the token Jew on this town council. Um, We go down again. Thomas said that's fine. I have friends that are black. That does not. I that does not reflect what I said, and I would never say something like that. My point being, at that time, and what I was saying is that it is offensive to say, I have friends that are black. I was responding to Matt Senior saying his mother is Jewish, um, because that would somehow explain why why I should be okay with what's been going on, and I'm not. Um, That's not what was said, Lisa, so right there. I'm just, if you want to be accurate, you, you basically said that my, my mother should look to her own religion or something. I didn't say that. Yes, you did. You can look at the I, tape. I, I don't, I know your mother is Jewish. That's fine. I'm saying, I was saying. And you interrupted my statement, so I didn't get to finish, so you get to now talk about it as if I said that. Okay, you can not, I'll finish then. You can say whatever you want. Um, Bottom line, excuse yeah. me. Go ahead. If you go back to the second paragraph on that page, 
I'm assuming the I in that paragraph are Thomas and not both Is that correct? Yes, sorry. That, yes, because it, you have Thomas and then a colon there. So it works in that situation. Um, my intent, what I was trying to say is who your friends and family are doesn't excuse the kind of behavior that I was calling out. And then in the, on the project memo is being discussed on page 13. Let me just find a place where we're talking about the depacking plant. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's not the minutes. That's my notes for later when we talk about the um, project memo. Thank you. Anybody else have anything in the minutes? Yeah. I have Senior? Oh, John Hand, do you want to go? E either way. Thank you. Um, so on page two, under the, the roll call, uh, I don't know if we can go back to the, the tape or whatever and determine who was in the room and who wasn't. Normally, we've indicated who's remote and who's in person. Um, I'm pretty sure that Lisa Conant was remote. I'm pretty sure that Matt O'Brien Jr. was remote. Um, I don't know if Richard Williams was remote or not. I don't he was recall. Here. That. I, that's why I said I don't recall. So maybe if um, we could go figure that out, who's remote, and, and make that, you know, re reflect reality. Yeah. Um, let's see, moving on, on page three, uh, when Lisa Thomas was speaking, so again, she's here, she could do that, under, so under the audience of citizens, Lisa Thomas, 255 Geraldine Drive, the second line in, about two-thirds of the way across the page, it says, the steering committee prior to those resolutions issued a memo. I think we received a memo. The yeah. steering committee received a memo. So that's received, not issued. Um, uh, the next line, the Brian Jr. read a statement that read the memo into the, it says into the records. I think we call it into the record. So just strike the S at the end there. Um, Couple more lines down below that. There's a line that begins with the word award. I think it was reward. Uh, but again, Lisa, you can do it. And, said, and mentioned a statistic that stated welfare checks. It's written currently says award single parent homes. I think it's reward in context. I don't, I don't know. Um, reward makes more sense there. Yeah. Yes, Ivan. I'm sorry, where is that? I can't find it in the line under Lisa Thomas, 255 Geraldine Drive, first word. Sixth line. Oh, the okay. line starts with award. Okay. Should be changed okay. to reward. Okay. Thank you. That's okay. Thank you for asking. Uh, second to last line of Lisa's comments, it says, uh, encourages hard work and two-parent households. I believe that should be hyphenated, two-parent. Uh, you already got that one, I already got that one. Moving on to page four, third bullet. It mentions my name, it says below motion, and then it says John Hand. Uh, there is no H in my first name. I got the H out. <laughs> What's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, get the H out, yeah. Um, and then make the, my last name have a capital, start with a capital H, please. Um, just below the minutes there, the second line slash paragraph, it starts Elsesser. It said, Elsesser said we have a temporary, I guess the way to read it right now would say temporary minute clerk. <laughs> I think he meant and did say minutes clerk. Is that right? So. Let's add an S to that minutes clerk. And then and you get a mention there, Yvonne. And Yvonne will be back in the next meeting. And lo and behold, here you are. Uh, so that's great. Moving right along. Already oh, got that one. Uh, OK. On page seven, 
the one, two, three, four, fifth uh, line slash paragraph. Yeah, I guess paragraph. It says, Han, Han said timing matters of apologies. Uh, I think I said something to the effect of, Han said the timing of the accusations and the timing of the apology matter. The implication there is why, why so long between them? Um, you're not adding to the sentence, right? You're just correcting it. Yeah, that's that's right. That's the same standard I'll hold you to, and have tried to hold you to in the past. It doesn't always stick, but um, don't go for them now. You have something to add, Matt? I have a, I have things to correct if you'd like. Okay, I'll, when I'm done. Thanks. Uh, just, just for Yvonne's sake, what, what are you agreeing to? I know you end up having a vote on it, but are you saying he had said timing of accusation and apologies matter? Well, I'll actually get to it because it's actually repeated down below under 8D. Uh, and that, that's most of it is exactly the way it's supposed to be. So it, I believe this might, it might be best to strike the first one just above 8D and then use the one that's in 8D Unless, I, I don't recall the exact timing of when it happened. I think we probably need to find that out from the context. That could be better had in the recording. I assume it was typed above 8D for some reason. Um, under 8D, the one just after the long paragraph that starts with Ryan Jr., the next one says, Williams said the timing of the accusations and the timing of the <coughs> apology matter. I'm pretty sure it was I that said that. And I think that's exactly what I said, which is what I was trying to correct the, uh, the line above AP to say. So just fix the attribution there. Um, covered, covered, already said, already said. <coughs> oh, on page 11, let there be light. On page 11, uh, first paragraph, uh, Three lines up from the bottom of that paragraph, there towards the end of the line, it says, we were not at the steering, but it was not intended. I just want to add the word meeting after steering. We were not at the steering meeting. Um, that might be my last addition. Oh, wait. On page 14, one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh paragraph starts, Elsesser, he does not know. That is why is uncomfortable. I wanted to insert the word he, why he is uncomfortable. With the council making, following that same line, making a formal request, he would like to find out if the council has any right first. I think that's supposed to be plural. It has any rights, plural, first. Um, and then on page 15, there is essentially a roll call again. And I have the same concern that it does not indicate, as is our tradition, to indicate who is in person and who is remote. And that's all I have. Thank, Thank you. Matt Senior. So on page one, towards the bottom of the page, the paragraph beginning with Williams is, um, he, he said a sawhorse or a flag system. He said, a, I believe he said a sawhorse with a sign prominently placed or a flag system. It's going to be, hope I don't go over the same one some of you did. It's hard to do this this way. On page three, I kind of think I have one at the top of the page. What would be the third paragraph down? Um, David Hayes was here, and I just made a uh, note over in the John margin. Hayes, actually. John. Yeah. All right, it just says Hayes. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I mixed him up. But he, I believe that somewhere it should talk about a tornado. Earlier, he was he was here talking about tornado damage, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think so. The, the word that. tornado doesn't appear here, but I, the gist, if you want people to know, <coughs> and I would probably like to see his first. I, I get if it was said earlier, but. Uh, on page two, I uh, add tornado damage has trees down and damaged sculptures. Okay. Thank you. All right, go on, Matt. On page four at the top of the first paragraph, the 
line that reads, read Board of, Edu Board of Education end of year projections. Well, education could be capitalized, I suppose, but I wasn't going there. End of year projections do not allow gaps. It's actually uh, do not follow gap. It's G A A P all capital, generally account acceptable accounting practices. What page? I'm sorry, I just want to follow. Top of four. Top of four. Thank you. First bullet. Yep. Uh, not senior. I'm not following the letter. Sure, I'll, I'll fix it. Um, page four, first bullet. The uh, fourth line. Okay. Fourth line. There's a word towards the right. It says G A P S. Gaps. Okay. It, should, it should be capital G, capital A, capital A, capital P, GAP. Okay. It's, a, it's an acronym for, okay. it stands for something generally accepted accounting practices. Principles. Principles, excuse me. On page uh, five, I would just ask under eight that instead of saying senior that we say O'Brien senior. It happens twice. I had a question on seven. There seems to be two eight Ds, first of all. Um, the fourth, I, think, I don't know if they're paragraphs, but the fourth grouping of words says eight D junior. And then below it, it says eight D steering committee O'Brien junior. So I'm confused as to what the eight D does there. I don't think that that's when, I'm not sure. I think it should be stricken, the eight D. And it should say O'Brien junior, I believe. I'm gonna, can I? Say it again, I'm sorry. The second one is agenda item 8.3.1.0. Okay, so do no, you want to correct higher, it? We're higher up than that, Yvonne. She sees. Oh, D, yeah, one is oh, eight way up the top. D and one is eight capital D. It's, it's, the fourth, it's the fourth grouping of words. I don't know if they're paragraphs, but it says 8D Junior, briefly respond. I'm sure that should be responded. Okay. ED, add ED. But I, I don't see what the 8D does there, and it should be O'Brien Jr., please. Can I, can I, I, I think I can help here. It appears, and maybe uh, whoever can jump in, it appears those two lines above the real 8 and the capital D with the periods, it appears those two are duplicative of, the, you know, it says 8D Jr. briefly responded to the audience. And then if you look just down at the real 8D, it actually is, O'Brien Jr.'s response with O'Brien Jr. And my comment, the hand said the timing matters and all that, is more fully done down just below that. I think we should strike the Both of them. eight little D line and the, the line that starts hand said timing matter, you know, just above eight D. It appears to be just a started and then done more fully below. It was notational for the record. I think she didn't forget to strike it. So totally yes. makes sense. Understood. So the uh, the first 8D, I think, should be under um, reports because that, that part of what I said occurred before the uh, committee report. So it was under general counsel report. So I don't think it needs a number. That's right. If, if we're going to keep it. So then it didn't occur under 8D is what you're saying, actually. No, I, I, don't, I don't believe so. So you were responding before you started your committee report? Correct. There were two different items. So can we move the 8D steering committee, O'Brien Jr., down below to just above the fourth, the third paragraph, which says we have not heard back from A.B. Shores. That was the beginning of an actual report, not having to do with those comments. Yep. Would that make sense to everyone? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So we have not heard back is the first part of the steering report. Okay. So strike the two lines, 8D Junior and hand said, and move 8D steering committee down to below uh, the main paragraph two. We have not heard back. Mm -hmm. Right above, above we have not yeah, heard above back. That, yeah, above that. Yeah, above that. Right above, we have not heard back. But Avery Shores, yes. That makes sense. So it was something that I wrote about at the time in the moment, period, and then start with 8D steering committee, O'Brien Junior. Um, on page eight, and I I think I'm correct on this, but we can talk about it. Under COBRA, 80, second paragraph, second line, uh, John Ossessor speaking, said we can get state money for period, or for, it, I, it, I don't know what the period is, and it says issues with bags. Um, I, I just said that type of system. I don't know if that's easier to. 
And then John said there are, there have been also issues with the bags. We shouldn't be putting more plastic into the system. Um, so if you say we can get state money for that type of system, I, I think that that's what John was saying, I believe. And then John said there have been issues with the bags, and it just adds more plastic into the system, which we shouldn't be doing. That's that's what I recall. Yep. And then, and then I, I had a question. I, I just on, in the paragraph <coughs> under cover, the second paragraph that starts with discussion. If you go all the way down to the one, two, three, four, fifth line, go to the right. It says, "Assuming the town council will be that committee." I, I'm just confused that that's not clear with to whom that refers or how we're doing that. I think somewhere, and I, I don't have full recollection, and we talked about the, the kind of building committee right. or decision committee for the well, transfer station. Could the council station. fill that need? Because <laughs> what, what I had said is the, the RFP or the concepts uh, engineering report is going to have two phases. One is a general phase that's a screen down to what the next phase is. And I think I said at that point, and the council, I assume, would be the committee that, that okay. does that because uh, we don't have another citizens committee the council serves as COVID. So you said I assume the town council will be that committee? Yes. Okay. So just change assuming to I assume about? That's fine. Yeah. And Lisa you added Lagoon ready did we actually add that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did they decide to do a second one then? Yeah. On, on page nine all the way at the bottom the last paragraph the second line just change the last word in the sentence. We have some project close out money that may be able to look at. That's look out. It's supposed to be to be looked at. Mm -hmm. On page 10, one, two, three, four, five, the sixth paragraph line, whatever they are, it says discussion over low volume and wide roads in the area. I think it was the width of the roads that we were talking about because they were too narrow, not because they were wide. I mean, we did Instead. say it's not wide enough to do that. I said it's not wide enough for safe biking, perhaps. Right, but we, yeah. so we didn't discuss low, low volume and wide roads in the right. area. <laughs> Would it be and width of roads? That's what I asked you to put in, yes. Yeah. Okay. Down below further, um, the paragraph starting with Elsesser said we have a building committee meeting. The, right before the beginning of the sentence that says drop in air conditioning system, I just wanted to add it is a, it is a drop in air conditioning system. John was mentioned, you know, stating that because we could add it later if that's how things go forward. And it says the piping. Is it the piping or the ducting? He said piping because he meant the water is flowing. Okay. The ducting is all there. You just have to add additional cold water pipe. So piping. So did you say that? So ducting? right now it says the piping is is all there, and I was wondering is that the correct set of words, or should it have said the ducting? They're both well? actually there. Okay. Um, you just change what's going through the pipe. Yep. Right. I do understand. Yep. It wasn't I understand the concept. I just wanted to know if it wasn't adding this pipes. matched what was said. <laughs> On page the top of page eleven. The second sentence, the only th two things that were recommended, and I'd like to fix this to say, recommended to be taken. So instead of, we're right after to be, just to add the word taken, out and then of the memo and used in the resolution were that progress is being made and that Co Coventry is a welcoming community and believe blah, blah, blah. So I'll do that again if you need me to, Yvonne. The only two things that were rec so what it should read is the only two things that were recommended to be taken out of the memo and used in the resolution were that progress is being made. Thank you. On page um, under 9B, but all, almost all the way down the bottom, it says Blanchard said this is a good thing, good thing, positive response from citizens. I just going to fix the sentence, but Blanchard said this is a good thing, and she, or she or we, I'm not sure what she said, have had good response from citizens. Okay. 
a positive response from citizen? Did you say she or we? Yeah. Did you say you or? I would think we. Okay, so we have had a positive response from citizen. On page 13, under 11.1, the paragraph, again, it says senior. Anywhere you see senior, Yvonne, if you could change it, please change it to O'Brien senior anywhere in the whole document if I missed any others. Uh, first lines, thank you. I think this is a practical proposal and other towns have very different, so I'm, I'm trying to, so this is the, I'm trying to, what are we talking about here? This is what the attorney said, correct? I was confused. I think you were saying that um, oh, it's okay. a practical proposal in other towns. Have very different rules right. from ours. Right. That's right. what it should say. Yeah, that's what I wrote here. In the, I couldn't figure out what I wrote. Mm -hmm. I think this is a practical proposal, and other towns have very different rules from ours on election days. Is that okay, Yvonne? Got it. And then in that same thing, it says signs are appropriate. It, it, that, it, that doesn't seem to have much of a meaning to the sentence. <laughs> is that? <laughs> it probably goes to the conversation around whether they could be stuck in the ground or not. Okay. You could probably strike it. Since yeah, you, you, the text, if we want to just strike it, signs are appropriate, I guess. I'm not sure. Because we're not arguing whether they can be there, it's whether they can be held or staked in the ground. And then um, keep going down below, two more, sen two more sentences, paragraphs, whatever they are. <laughs> O'Brien Sr. said, I am making, I would be making a request of the board if necessary. That's what I said. John was asked, he was saying that the council doesn't have jurisdiction, and I said, I, I, I just got done saying that we'd be making a request of the board if that's necessary. Page 15, almost done. The third paragraph, O'Brien Sr. said there, there are no rules in writing. We need to find out, period, it says. But what it was was, I said, we need to find out who has authority and what, if any, rules exist. And then O'Brien Jr.'s line following that, it said, then what, it, what, it says, O'Brien Jr. said in 2019, a guy put up a tent and he did not take it down. Then what happens? A crime or a ticket? I, I, it didn't seem clear here. I think, I thought Matt was trying to get to it. What happens if someone refuses to take down the tent, but I'm not sure, is that what you intended, Matt? Yeah, it was a question. So where did 2019 come into the question? I just got confused. It was the 2019 Oh, so if, if, if in 2019 he had, someone had put up a tent and then not taken it down? No, 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 it was a statement that someone had and they were asked to take it down and they did. Right, but this says, and, and he did not take, and... No, it says he did take it down. It says a guy put up a tent, and he did, oh, he did take it down. Then what happens, a crime or ticket, so... No, I think, I think it was, what would happen if he didn't take it down? Okay, then let's say, what, what, then what would happen if he had not taken it down? Would it be a crime or a ticket? And, and someone and said... I said it's a legal John question. John Elsesser said that's a legal question. Very good. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. You're welcome. Please decone it. Please it. Uh, on page six at the top, um, I just was hoping we could uh, just, there's some sentence fragments in here and some uh, run on sentence, and I'm just hoping we could kind of clarify and clean this up a little. Um, uh, Lisa already pointed out the whole uh, uh, pass through, um, and thank you, Lisa, on uh, this in the second line. Um, On um, the third sentence that starts, just so we're all clear, and you know I speak for every council, if we could just strike, I think. Um, <laughs> and then um, after, the, after the sculpture fields, put instead of a period, put a comma, and uh, just say, and others in local re residents and businesses, and then strike the rest of that fragment. And let me know, Yvonne, if that's clear. Yes. I did not follow that second point. Okay. Uh, the sentence should read, just so we're all clear, and you know, you know I speak for every member of this council and for John Elsesser and town staff, 
that we all care very much about what happened with the tornado at the sculpture fields and others in local residences and businesses. And you could just just end it with a period, please. Mm -hmm. So okay. in, instead of others in, would it just be other? Okay, thank you. And then um, right after that where it says, so just to make that clear, that can be struck. Lisa, can I ask a quick question? Yes. So it's just a, the wording of the, of, the, of the end of the sentence, that's all. Um, said, uh, just to be clear, oh, I lost my place. So. Oh, it says, it, so you said, um, with the tornado at the sculpture field and others in local residences? Is that, is that did you want to say yes. other, other, okay. So I was just going to say, and, and local residences and businesses. You meant yes. people in them? And then after, after businesses, just put a period. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, um, and this last sentence, which goes a lot around for a, a while, is, is kind of not really clear. Um, I grew up in a single parent household from age 15 on, comma, we also did not have very much money, but it's not really about me. That's, that's what I have said. And, and I know it's unclear because there was an argument going on in the room at the time and it was um, difficult to hear. Can you continue, can you, can you fix, keep reading the sentence? Exactly, it's not really about me. And the rest of that, what was the sentence is written? Um, then it, it's about being offended that the memo was written in the context of race, and racism, mm -hmm. comma, and the implications of that memo saying, excuse me, not saying, strike saying, saying, implying that black families and families of color are mostly headed up by single parents, and that's why they are failing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that the same? Exactly, and then just strike the rest of that. I did not say that's my speech. Okay, so in this instance, all the eyes are coming. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And then um, a little farther on down the page, it's I, I, I can't remember if this we. we to this one, it's not illegible arguing, it's unintelligible arguing. I don't know what that needs to be. Um, and then uh, just going down to page 14. Page 14? Page 14, yep. Okay, I'm there. Okay, um, the, sense, the paragraph that starts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 paragraphs down. It says, Conant said, I read this through, mm -hmm. um, and I know in other states they will give out food and drink to people standing in line, although some states are trying to stop that now. They will give out food and drink. People standing in line are trying to step in line. Okay. Yes. Um, and then, do we have jurisdiction over making ordinances or rules or, or whatever during elections, or would that fall to the state? And just end that with a question mark. And okay. strike the cost. And that's it. Thank you, Eva. You're All right. Any other council members? All those in favor of approving the minutes with the corrections, please say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Yes, please. What number is it? Oh, it's going to be under 8 somewhere. Can we move up? 8 yeah. F 21 slash 22 dash 30 Senior Housing Alternative Study Committee Report. Second. Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Welcome and sorry. Please come forward. Those of you that want to present from the table. 
a strong and healthy community like Coventry is one that um, should provide housing options for all stages of life. So after analyzing the survey results, um, we backed up our findings by finding that up to 31% of Coventry seniors would be interested in moving in senior housing if it becomes available. So the need is, um, we, we found, we calculated that there's a demand for a total of 332 units today and 437 units in total by 2030. Um, but in, to put this in perspective, this equates to about four senior units per 10 households, per 10 senior households. Uh, currently today, there's one senior unit available for every 10 senior household. Almost all demand is within the low and moderate income range, which is considered households earning an income less than roughly $75,000 a year. Um, so this is um, pretty much demand for low and moderate income seniors rather than higher income seniors. So it's not just about a number of units, it's also about the quality, design, and features of units. Um, we really have a um, promote, we're promoting a key sense of community, creating a sense of community, accessibility, and quality of life. Then lastly, the solution we propose are simply to provide support from the public sector, from government, and our partnerships. What we found was that housing costs, um, such as rent or homeownership, or affordable, um, low to moderate incomes, do not cover the cost of construction. So low and moderate income rents uh, do, does not cover the cost of new construction. So that way, the government needs to step in through policy incentives, through resources, through other types of subsidies and incentives to fill the feasibility gap. And the town can, can leverage land, resources, policies, and partnerships to reduce the cost and create value for senior housing development. Next part um, for demand and considerations. Uh, let, let's review how we came to these conclusions. So the story I want to tell uh, for you all to take away from this data is that the majority of housing available in Coventry is not fit for the fastest growing demographic. Starting from the top left um, graph, we see that 94% of housing in Coventry is currently detached single family dwellings. There's one in three older adults living alone currently in Coventry. One in four senior households are overburdened by housing costs, which is paying more than 30% of their income um, on housing expenses. The majority of seniors or three in five households would qualify for subsidized affordable housing by meeting a roughly 75,000 income restriction, um, and that's a that's a rough um, number there. But it's pretty much anywhere 80 percent of the area median income, which is AMI. And uh, just lastly, the last graph on the bottom right corner shows that the 65 and older population is going to grow by 1,658 people by 2030. Or, through 20, uh, the year 2000 and 2040, whereas every other age cohort is going to either stay the same or decrease in population during that same time. So Coventry's housing market is not um, in, a, in a bubble. It's influenced by the surrounding regions. region. The regional age population, uh, 65 <coughs> population will grow by 13% in the next decade, um, which is roughly half of the rate of Coventry, where Coventry is going to grow by 27% in the next decade, um, but 173 total throughout the last uh, 20 years and until 2040. So in the region, there's currently about one senior unit available for um, every 38 older adults um, from my findings. So the, I want to highlight two case studies um, in the local region that really stand out as replicable models that the town of Coventry can really take inspiration from. Um, the first one on the top is Button Hill in Wellington, which is a 24-unit affordable senior housing development delivered by the Wellington Housing Authority and our very own uh, Lloyd Bradley, the executive director of the Coventry Housing Authority, 
um, worked on that project. Um, so she has that experience. So this project was preliminarily funded by um, DOH home funds through um, affordable loans and through some capital expenditure through the town of Willington. And then the second case study is Gan Aiden and Stone Ridge Estates in Lebanon, um, which was developed through a uh, town request for proposals or RFP process, which found a developer to build and manage new housing in the town. Um, on town-owned property adjacent to their senior center. So those are pretty uh, standard types of um, models for bringing housing, public type um, supported housing. So the senior housing community survey, this is probably the highlight of our work over the last year or so. We engaged um, every senior uh, household in Coventry we sent out um, ma targeted mailings to all 1,068 senior households in Coventry, and we also provided a digital version of the survey on the manager's Facebook page. Um, I, so I just want to thank for anyone listening on tonight, just thank anyone that um, completed that survey and took the time to complete it. Uh, we received 553 in total. Um, 456 of which were complete enough to be able to use for our analysis, um, which ends up being a statistically significant sample size, um, so we can comfort comfortably um, base our decisions on these findings. So what we found is that 10% of senior households are very likely to move into senior housing, and another 21% are likely to move into senior housing, equaling about 30% that are um, likely to move in if it comes available. So to answer, um, are there any patterns of who is looking for senior housing, just to get an, a sense of um, who would be moving in? What we found are that households with incomes less than 75,000 are more likely. Uh, we found that these seniors find Coventry important to them and staying in Coventry important. They are more likely to be involved in the senior center. They have Home values between 100, um, 100,000 and 199,000, and they're more likely to be disabled. The four factors that did not show a difference in likelihood to move into senior housing. So um, these are areas where we found no difference whether someone would or would not move into senior housing it includes the fact that they're older, no difference in age, that they have a mortgage. Whether you have a mortgage or not, there is no difference. And then for anyone living alone, we do not find a difference there in whether they move into senior housing. All right, so just to calculate our demand estimates, we use the community survey, the demographic and housing data um, to calculate several factors. And through this, we found that there are 332 units in demand today and 437 units in 2030. Um, this is the high, the peak ceiling number, um, but in actuality, people that indicate on a survey that they're interested might not in actuality move into senior housing. So we reduce this amount and also to fit into the Coventry development patterns, um, a realistic type number. We've got the 114 units today and then 150 units in 2030. So for project considerations, besides the numbers, we um, want to consider who this senior housing is being developed for and the needs and preferences of that audience. The two characteristics, um, putting characteristics into, a into buckets for motivations to move into senior housing there's a need-based crowd. Um, these are um, folks with health and financial needs, so they really need to move into senior housing for those reasons. And then there's also de desire-based type audience for uh, folks seeking lifestyle changes. They don't want to mow their lawns anymore. They don't want to upkeep a single-family home necessarily. Um, they, they're seeking a sense of community and social um, interactions, and then also just convenience. Some, some also fall into both of these sectors. 
um, the audience profile table to the right um, kind of breaks down the priorities and values of each of these types of folks, um, just to make sure that our housing is successful and it reaches the target audience. Um, for considerations, we recommend a unit mix of um, including independent active senior rentals is the most advantageous at the moment. Um, we see that mixed incomes through low and moderate incomes is um, important, and higher density should really create added benefits that would not have been possible without increased density, um, such as built-in affordability and amenities and walkability. The typology, we recommend uh, something that fits into the community fabric, like colonial village architecture, and we really like a cottage core layout. Access for walkability, bikeability, shuttle services, access to services, um, so reducing car dependency for uh, seniors that can't drive or want added convenience. And then lastly, location. One of the advantages of senior housing is you can move away from your sub, um, suburban neighborhood and have you know closer access to walkable shops or um, groceries or um, the senior center or other added amenities and destinations nearby. So now um, let's get into the numbers. Um, this is what we found for financing. Um, what I did was put together some simple pro forma um, out of back of the napkin numbers. So each graph here represents financing for four different concepts, all with 12, 24, or 50 units. The difference between each concept is the percentage of income restricted units versus non income restricted units or moderate market rate units, um, all with <coughs> corresponding uh, square footages with, with their unit mix. These pro forma assessments are intended to be, uh, you know, a, a hypothetical snapshot, um, but they all follow the same cost assumptions. Each concept offers uh, affordable rents for low and moderate incomes, which range between $500 a month to um, $2,150 uh, a month for rent, depending on income. And on, on the graphs, the red segments represent the financing gaps for each concept, where traditional bank loans and low-income housing tax credits um, combined with um, the rents that are generated from this property would not cover the full cost of development. So that's the five feasibility gap that we identified. In the first concept, a 60-40 development, there is a gap between 1.2 and 3.2 million. This gap increases to 1.9 and 5.9 million for a 2080 development. In concept three, the gap significantly decreases with a 100% affordable housing unit due to the costs um, covered by a 9% lower end housing tax credit. Um, and then lastly, the concept four a fully market rate um, with moderate income target um, without access to tax credits would have a 2.2 to $7.3 million gap. So what we found was the low income housing tax credits really helped, um, but it was pointed out through the housing authority that things have changed and these tax credits are very competitive and also um, not focusing on senior housing, but they're um, you, you're required to have some family type affordable housing included in your development. Um, so that's just an added um, constraint. But um, in summary, private sector market rate units are not fe feasible without some type of public subsidy or cost reduction um, of some sort. So to break down understanding the barriers and opportunities available to the town of Coventry. Um, we can break down some barriers and we can leverage some of our opportunities. We've identified um, two tip, uh, different types of barriers, one that government can control and one that government really can't have much control over. The first being um, infrastructure, public sewer is limited. What we did find was that public sewer um, actually not, might not be as um, cost effective as private septic on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but there's added constraints without 
um, public sewer. Zoning, um, low density zoning is typical in Coventry, which um, that's just a development pattern, uh, but that's just not another tool we can use. And public funding for um, competitive and limited funding opportunities, that's, that's something that um, we need to consider. Non-government environmental constraints with wetlands and slopes in Coventry, um, the market conditions, um, and even labor force available. Uh, we all know through COVID, um, construction costs increased, financing, um, interest rates, and credit. Um, these are all just added um, efforts, especially with affordable housing. Um, it's usually part of a blended mix of financing, which complicates things. And then public opinion. Um, when we're talking about affordable mixed mixed use or mixed income, um, multifamily housing, um, there's going to be um, some concerns from the public. Um, some are, you know, absolutely reasonable, and we need to um, take that into account. Uh, but that's just another barrier to to uh, consider. And then for opportunities to leverage the Coventry Housing Authority, of course, with their expertise, knowledge, land um, management, and capabilities in this arena. Um, there, I just want to point out that they're looking at a very um, large range right now, not just senior housing, but also family housing. So everything is kind of on the table for them, which is exciting opportunity. The incentive housing zone plan, which was completed, I believe, in 2011, um, which is an existing template for policy reform for density bonuses, a, a form of policy incentive we can pull from. The plan of conservation development of 2020, which encourages alternative housing options, um, showing that the community vision is in, aligned with this plan. And then lastly, the C, uh, Connecticut General Statute 830G, um, which requires each town to have 10% affordable housing in their town or else there's disincentives for that. Um, and there's many other state um, incentives and, and goals right now for affordable housing. All right, so to wrap up, um, last section here are our solutions um, through goals, tools, and recommendations. First, our goal of um, allowing more senior housing unit availability. That's just a goal that we want to strive for. Second, we want to eliminate affordable senior housing shortages by creating a target of 112 senior low income housing units by 2030. Goal number three would be to allow moderate income seniors access to senior housing by creating 35 uh, medium, moderate income housing units by 2030. And then lastly, number four, provide affordable and diverse housing that meets the needs, desires, and lifestyles of seniors. So large component of, that of sense of community, social cohesion, and opportunities for he, um, seniors to live out their years in a quality environment. All right, so we identified um, three policy menus, each with their own theme. Um, these are strategies we can use to reach our our goals, the first one being production and preservation. We recommend um, amending zoning regulation section 5.13, which is um, for uh, multifamily condominiums and senior housing is included in there. Um, so we, we listed some recommendations there. Um, the second zoning policy uh, reform would be adopting cottage cluster zoning, which is a specialty, specialty type of housing uh, for co-housing and cottage clusters. Um, number three would be a, allowing accessory apartments, um, just building on our in-law apartment um, regulations and reviewing how um, that would be an added benefits, and benefit for seniors. Four would be target infrastructure investments, um, so continue to uh, expand or look to um, invest in public infrastructure like public sewer and allocating um, unit availability through existing public sewer space. Number five would be allowing age-restricted housing in the form of multifamily dwellings. Um, so just more access to affordable type accessible housing for seniors. Six, establishing public-private partnerships or PPP with a private developer. Um, so bringing in a private developer 
people that have experienced in this um, to build housing in Coventry. Seven, locate senior housing on surplus town land or community land. So identify underutilized land um, that Coventry owns and building housing on that like Lebanon did. Eight would be to consider redeveloping Orchard Hill Estates. Um, this is a um, the, you know, the current use of the property, so it would be um, blending well with that and um, using the Coventry Housing Authority as um, one of our major assets and opportunities. And then nine would be consider acquisitions of accessible housing units through um, foreclosures or tax um, delinquency properties and converting those into affordable senior units or other types of units. All right, so policy two, accessibility and livability, adopting design guidelines for senior housing would provide a blueprint for developers to come in and have a vision already in place that the community would back. Number two would be to connect seniors with accessible units, um, provide resources and one-stop shop in the town hall or um, senior center for um, seniors to have additional access to um, knowledge of accessible units. And then three would be encourage and educate developers about innovative approaches. Um, so really, um, engage with developers through the process of development and, and see if we can work out um, unique and innovative approaches. All right, number three would be financing assistance, uh, financial assistance through development, development cost subsidies, tax credit subsidies, <coughs> financing subsidies, operating subsidies, um, rental assistance subsidies, and project generating cross subsidies. So not all subsidies are um, necessarily monetary coming out of the town's general fund necessarily. Um, there's many different forms of subsidies. So um, any form of incentive or help to reduce costs and add value for development to close that financing gap um, is what's needed. So lastly, our requested actions for next steps uh, for the town council to make. Um, we would like to, one, formalize a permanent housing committee to oversee the next steps. Um, so building on our current um, senior housing alternative study committee. Number two would be to conduct a potential, on potential for infill or redevelopment at Orchard Hill Estates and the surrounding town property. Um, we see that as a, um, if we do a phased approach where the town uh, focuses on the most vulnerable um, the need-based community, Orchard Hill Estates is likely um, the first step that should be taken. Uh, three, conduct additional analysis of other viable sites to determine targets. We've listed in our appendix of the report uh, a list of potential properties that could fit senior housing, um, so building on that. Um, conducting a study for amending the zoning regulations, Number five, considering drafting a request for proposals um, for public-private partnerships. Six, provide additional support for seniors to age in place um, through um, adapting their, their property for um, handicap ramps or other types of accommodations in, inside their single-family homes. And then lastly, expanding the charge of the community to include study on community building and need for um, needs for the senior center, which weren't include, included in the current charge. Um, so expanding the charge to include those items. And uh, that is that is all I have for tonight. Uh, thank you, take, thank you all very much. And, uh, I'll take any questions if you have. Any. Thank you. <clears throat> any council members have any questions of Mark at this time? John Hand. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to say thank you to all the members of the committee that are present and those on remote. I want to say thank you very much to Mark for uh, coming back to do this, essentially. Uh, it, it is noticed and appreciated, so thank you for that. Uh, this is comprehensive as it is very comprehensive. Uh, you guys really did your work. I want to thank the, the committee. It, it's really amazing. Um, it's a deep dive. So thank you for that. It's 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 great information. Lisa Thomas, this is an amazing blueprint for us to follow. I had no idea that this was going to be the. 
outcome of volunteer work, basically. It's so professional. And um, kudos to Mark for distilling this all down to those slides. Somebody did a good job with you in school teaching you how to summarize. <laughs> we, we might need you in our classrooms. Um, and it would be great if we could have access to those slides to help us I, I distill them. this. I just had them. Oh, fantastic. But this, this is incredible. And of course, um, it, it's kind of changing my perspective on my future. Um, as I'm into retirement and contemplating what happens to me moving forward over the next 20 to 30 years. I think um, we'd just like to thank uh, Mark and Eric for putting up with us um, <laughs> for this length of time. Um, I don't think it's been easy, but <laughs> they sat through it. So, And I, I think it's opened our eyes um, to, to different changes as we went through the process and looking at different facilities and stuff. So it's, it's been eye-opening. The statistics about population change are just... Well, that, well, that we can attest to. Really eye-opening. <laughs> We're there. Hmm. Anybody have any questions? Richard? I make sure I'm not, I'm not on mute. I just want to also echo both what John and Lisa said about the, the depth of the report. It, it really is eye-opening and uh, just a great treasure trove of information. And thank you for everybody who participated on it. It, it really opened my eyes. Thank you, Lisa Conan. Um, I'm going to jump on the thank you bandwagon here. Um, I think that um, the report is an incredible um, compilation of data and information, and it really is amazing the job you've all done. Um, it's also made me start to think about what uh, in my future. But, um, you know, really, I, I, I'm kind of a data nerd myself, and I really found some of this information about the need going into the future extremely interesting and um, thank you thank you so much for your years of work all of you, thank you. matt jr yeah thank you mark and eric and the whole committee i think you've gone above and beyond um, on this report i'm surprised and impressed uh, it's a lot to digest and i look forward to studying it lisa thomas i actually have a question um, when I've been talking to people in the community, there, so, um, there were a couple of folks who I spoke with who are 55 and over, um, and they were asking me about what's happening in, in Coventry for options for them, and I was really proud to be able to talk about this committee. They're looking to downsize from a house that's way too big for them. They actually went to Willington to look at what was there, um, and, and apparently there's those units are full for years and years to come. And they spoke very highly of, um, on Route 44 in stores, there's a community called Rolling Hills um, that's moving to small prefab houses. Um, I don't know if that's something that's also viable. Well, when you finish that, you have to, some answers, but. That's no, that's, that's my question. I just, and I told them that I would bring that question to you when you came to new, present to us. That's a new one. Well, I, uh, let me start by saying I'm a retired professional statistician and demographer, pre-baby boomer. I'm, I'm the silent generation, if you can believe that. Um, and, and to me, I'm a, I'm a statistician, but I took a look at the comments. We got a hundred comments. Julie, you're nodding. Maybe they, did they send them. out <laughs> all those comments, so many of them, were, I'm too young to think about this now, but thank you for thinking about it. That, that is the biggest takeaway in terms of, you gotta look at statistics realistically. And I will tell you that I wrestled with Mark and I still have a few <laughs> little, little differences of opinion there, but I'm not your thesis advisor, Mark, so you're off the hook on that for now. <laughs> so uh, I, I, even to me, and I, I've known for decades, 
When we started 30 years ago, we used to call, what you now call millennials, we called it the baby boom echo. And there are newspaper articles about it. So, so, um, I'll stop there because I'm getting old and I forget where I started. Sandra? I'd just like to say that we appreciate your appreciation of the work that went into this. And Mark and Eric certainly put a great deal of work and our committee as well. But the best way that one could demonstrate appreciation for the efforts that have been put forth is to uh, put into effect the first um, follow through, which is the creation of a permanent senior housing committee to continue the work that's been outlined here. Uh, and I would like to suggest that while I think our committee um, was comprised of an interesting combination of people, all of whom were totally well-intentioned and worked hard, that the following committee should contain more people who have knowledge of building and construction and creation of this. I think those people on the committee who wanted to continue would be able to offer a lot of knowledge and follow through. But I think the new people that would be put on the committee should have some kind of construction <coughs> uh, and organizational aspect from this perspective. And we thank you very much. Matt Senior. I just didn't want to be the only one not to comment because I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm equally as impressed and, and uh, I was very excited and, and you may know that I like to, as, as uh, Lisa said, she's a kind of a data nerd, but I, I got through about 50 pages and I you know, started having a few concept questions and getting there. I'd like to finish going through the whole thing, you know, and really get through it all before I come back to you with specific questions and things. Um, but there's a lot to in here that, you know, really grabbed my attention, that certainly uh, great ideas that came forward. Um, so I start my wheels going, you know, and <laughs> that's, that's what, you know, that's what happens. And uh, obviously some of this is dependent on what we can find for properties and, you know, the land and, you know, things like that too. So, um, so there's a lot of work still to be done, but, um, you know, what this, I was like blown away, you know, kind of by what, what this was and how you did it. And um, the next half of me is, so now I got to look into the detail of, you know, all those different things that you're telling me, but um, obviously we all recognize that there was an issue and a problem and, you know, things that we needed to work on and you know, we want to continue that work, you know, so um, whether or not, to, I don't I don't know that we're going to authorize a committee tonight, but I think there's some work that goes into authorizing a committee and developing, you know, the membership and all the other things that we'd want to do before we do that. But I, I, I think, I, I doubt very much that anybody here wouldn't be in favor of continuing the process. So, But thank you. Thank you all. Thank and, you. So Mark, are you open for questions? You know, yeah, something like by email or something. <laughs> we have. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no. I just want, yeah, just I want to say thank you all. Um, thank. It was really a privilege to work alongside the committee members and um, Eric for providing great guidance and leadership throughout this whole process. And um, it's been great to continue my work for Coventry and continue to serve Coventry um, while I've uh, moved away. So um, yeah. So I think with that, um, I'm. I'm always available for questions and comments. I know that this is a lot to comprehend. It was a, it was a large report, um, and there's a lot of steps to take from here. Um, and you know, um, as we start to analyze those recommendations, um, I'd be happy to um, continue in some form or manner. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll talk about those details. But um, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, I can provide that information. I believe. I didn't want to impose. That's all. Thank or you. we could work it through Eric, um, either way, whatever works uh, for Eric and the committee. Um, so, so yeah, and we understand that this is the last evening for the, the council, and, and we understand that we'll, we'll uh, have more work to do moving forward. So, yeah. Does anyone have any questions for me at this time tonight? I know it's a lot to take in. I don't see any. Did you want to say something, John? Yeah. Uh, I forwarded off uh, a digital copy of the report and the presentation to the council. Uh, and what I forwarded to you was an email that I sent to an old uh, friend and acquaintance of mine that uh, came up through uh, 
Connecticut Conference of Municipalities, and now he's in the development, uh, business development uh, business. Uh, he was involved with Duncan Park, and he, he's now working for a company called Wulsan, uh, which is the largest senior housing developer on the East Coast. So he came up today to meet with us, and I gave him your report over the weekend to say some light reading. Right? <laughs> light reading, yeah. And he read. And we met with him today, uh, Eric, uh, uh, Eric and I, and a, a few other staff <coughs> people, to talk about development uh, possibilities. And just for the committee and, and Mark, he said, you guys did this in-house? He said, this is one of the best <coughs> reports I've seen. And, and I predicted it. I <laughs> predicted it. Did I not, Eric? And, and this is from a guy that, like, part of his business is to read these types of reports. And he walked out of here with the reports and our maps of some of the projects <coughs> we've done for the Bolton Develop Gateway project where we'll have sewers and the, and the design things we have. He says, you know, you guys, you've set the table, as Eric, <laughs> Eric accuses that, and now, now it's time to put the curtains up. So um, <laughs> some expressions we use internally that you got to do your background, and you guys helped do the background, and now we're going to be able to get the attention for those private partnerships and so forth. And it's really exciting. For years, we've talked about a, part, a partnership within our own partners, uh, in the Housing Authority. And, and they've, they're, they're kind of up, up ahead saying, we need the vitality of multi-generational things because the Housing Authority already has multi-generational. We call it senior housing. But people with other special uh, types of need, needs uh, have the right to move in now. So uh, they're, they're willing to look at, because they tightened the sewer, the land that used to be their septic system uh, has a capability. So they have land. So it's exciting that we've got a lot, lot of motion going here. And I just want to let you know that the first review was very positive by the private sector, which is what really matters. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that they said you're on the right track. And they were stunned that this was done internally. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, I can't say <laughs> enough about the talent of our staff and our volunteers and our firefighters and our EMS. I mean, it's like amazing. Mm -hmm. So thank you, guys. And 80% of the survey respondents want to stay in Coventry. He, he, he combined it with income and stuff mm -hmm. appropriately. But 80% of the respondents want to stay here. A good place. And a number of neighboring towns have had projects fairly recently, uh, so it can be done. <coughs> and uh, I would hate to think that we're going to keep watching other towns deal with this while, while we don't. So I, I would hope that there's going to be a certain amount of carryover from this council to the next council, and those of you who will be sitting with the next council two and a half weeks from now we'll remember that mm -hmm. uh, you can honor our work mm -hmm. by allowing it to continue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I remember the, the specific answer you asked about Rolling Hills in Mansfield. I've been talking to Mansfield 40 years ago they decided they were going to be a planned community. That's why they have a senior center surrounded by senior housing, uh, low income affordable. And then the next ring is moderate income affordable. And then there's an outer ring of things like Glen Ridge and Rolling Hills. So there is not, it's not an accident that that's a university community. <laughs> so I say plagiarism is the sincerest form of flattery. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. All right, anybody have anything else to add? No. We've, we've kept you guys late enough, and I apologize yeah, for we're all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. Nice seeing you all. Thank you. 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 All right, next on our agenda is our consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve it, Matt Senior? Move to approve the consent agenda. And a second. 
Lisa Thomas. Thank you. Is there anything anyone wants to remove from our consent agenda this evening? It's a quarter of ten, no. I do. <laughs> Lisa. Um, I would like to remove um, 6D, the steering committee. It's a steering committee item, so I just figured that's the best way to do it. Yeah. Anybody else? Just, just so we can do an acknowledgement, uh, I'd like to remove 6F8. Yeah. Thank you. Retirement of tax collector, Linda Greenbacker. All right. Everybody in favor of approving our consent agenda, removing item 6D and 6F8, please say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Thank you. Um, under reports, I just want to quickly say um, our chief of police, Mark Palmer, has retired. We have an acting chief, Jeff Spajinski. We had a nice reception for the chief for his retirement recently. Um, and then we obviously, Dorothy Grady mentioned that we lost Harvey Barrett today, and that's a great loss to our community. He was a very giving person. Are there any other members that want to report this evening? Matt Senior? I just would like to also just speak about Harvey just briefly. I, I, I was taken by surprise, mm -hmm. even though I know that he's been very ill because I've been in touch with him on a regular basis. But um, Harvey is one of the really good ones. Um, he worked really, really hard. Um, he got things done. Um, that's, that's probably what you know, everyone knows him best as. But um, he was just a wonderful, likable, generous person, you know, and, and I'm going to miss him terribly. Um, he's a good friend. Lisa Conant. <coughs> um, yes, I, I wanted to extend my condolences to the Barrett family um, in Maryland in particular. Um, I also wanted to thank Carolyn Aragolis for her very kind and unexpected remarks today at uh, Audience of Citizens. Um, a little overwhelmed and, and the remarks are much appreciated. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, on Saturday I attended a ribbon cutting at um, JDM Imports in uh, the village. It's located in the old Sanborns uh, garage and um, you know, it's really an interesting business. The cars are really neat to take a look at and um, I wish them every success. Um, I also did want to mention that um, there was a cleanup weekend at the David Hay Sculpture Fields on Saturday and Sunday. Um, lunch was provided by Highland Park, and uh, the Journal Inquirer did a really nice write-up of it um, today in today's paper. If anybody wants to check that out. Any other council members have anything to report? Lisa Thomas? Um, well, I want to start also by um, remembering Harvey. Every once in a while, he'd see me somewhere, even if it was walking down the street, and he'd pull his, up his car, and I'd be like, oh, no. <laughs> um, he just always had words of advice or strong suggestions to share, and they were always really good words of advice and suggestions to consider and think about because always in the end he just had our community at heart. Um, I also wanted to just take a minute to respond to some of the things from audience of citizens um, and I want to talk first about what um, Brian Murray and Howard Haber um, addressed with their concerns in their neighborhood and I, I don't want to talk specifically about that business. But I do want to talk about um, what seems to be perhaps a weakness that we need to address um, as a town. Uh, I Several people have reached out to me about their concerns um, on Cassidy Hill and, and wanting to be able to enjoy their neighborhood and the peace and quiet and safety of their neighborhood. Um, and I kept saying, well, we need to look at moving forward and, and how do we address this? And so I 
um, had sent questions to Eric Trott and to John, both of whom answered me several times as I tried to, to figure out and understand the issues. And I think one of the, the weaknesses, one of the issues is that um, it seems that our zoning enforcement is in large part based on waiting until there's a complaint. And in my mind, that's pitting our, our residents against one another in some cases. And we had this conversation when we worked on our blight ordinance some time ago. Um, it's also pitting residents against our local businesses, and we don't want that either. Um, so I think uh, we should definitely have a goal moving forward to do some creative problem solving around, first of all, making sure that residents on private property, whether it's a wetland issue, a permit on, a, on private property, or whether it's a, a business permit, that first of all, those all the pieces of compliance for the permit are, have checked all the boxes. And that seems to have fallen through the cracks here. Um, and then I think you know there needs to be, a, I know we don't have a lot of staff, and maybe that's something we need to look at, but I think we really need to move forward um, with a plan that we're going to check in on these permits that we've issued and make sure, as time goes by, that they're still being honored. Um, we can't have situations develop where, after whatever number of years, those permits lose their value and we lose the commitment to the community that lies behind those permits. So, you know, for people to have to come tell us that they don't feel safe on their street, they, they're verbally abused because they've ended up in, in arguments and misunderstandings with their neighbors, um, that's not what our community should be about and that's not how we should be building our, our our planning and our zoning in our community. So um, I just, I wanted to, to mention that and make sure that that is in the record for us to come back to. We also received some letters that I want to share um, relevant to some comments during Audience of Citizens, including my own last week. Um, and these are letters that came to us as council members, so I'm not sure where they would end up showing up, so I want to make sure that these are shared and in the record. We received a letter from Alan Sanantino who wrote regarding the memo referenced by Matthew O'Brien Jr. during the steering committee meeting of August 23rd, 21. It is troubling that members of the town council state they quote, agree that there has been racism in all its forms in the United States, close quote, and in the next paragraph claim, quote, uh, claim they quote, do not believe black people are oppressed and disadvantaged because they are black, close quote. It is logically incompatible to simultaneously lay claim to both propositions. We also have a letter from um, Kathy Sementino. Dear council member, I strongly support Coventry's resolution on racism. I am, however, deeply concerned about the memo submitted by some council members and read at the 823 steering committee meeting. Views expressed in that memo run counter to the spirit of the recently passed resolution on racism and indeed show a profound misunderstanding of what systemic racism is. The memo starts by acknowledging past racial trends in America, notes that this country has made progress away from those, quote, beliefs and attitudes, close quote, and ends by basically blaming the victims by attributing the challenges black people face to their failure to build strong families. Additionally, the memo's writers attribute that breakdown of families to government welfare programs, providing no references to substantiate that claim. The writers of the memo fail to understand that systemic or structural racism is not, first of all, about personal prejudices held by individuals. Rather, the term refers to policies, laws, ordinances, business practices, and other quite legal institutions that have served to suppress the ability of people to, of color to accumulate wealth, to build savings that allow for the purchase of a home, to have a safety net to fall back on when family emergencies or job losses occur, to contribute to a child's education. Owning property has been a key to raising the standard of living for Americans, yet this opportunity for building wealth has been systemically denied to black people. The roots go back far. Shortly after the federal government denied freed slaves reparations in the form of 40 acres and a mule, it bestowed land grants to white families. From 1868 to 1934, the federal government gave away 246 million acres in 160 acre tracts nearly 10% of all the land in the nation to more than one and a half million white families. 
black families were not so included in the Homestead Act awards. <coughs> Oops. I just lost my page, sorry. Okay. Some 46 million American adults today, nearly 20% of all American adults, descend from those white homesteaders. If that many white Americans can trace their legacy of wealth and property ownership to a single entitlement program, then the perpetuation of black poverty must also be linked to national policy. The legacy of denying property ownership to black people continued into the 20th century. We all know the story of Levittown, New York, perhaps the most famous example of a post-World War II planned suburban development. Levittown is an example of how racist policies were perpetuated. The developer of the town, Levitt and Sons, was able to build thanks to loans from the Federal Housing Administration on the condition that leases that barred those who were, quote, not members of the Caucasian race, close quote. And we know that 90% of the loans the Federal Housing Authority insured from 1935 to 1962 went to white Americans. I cite these examples in the effort to indicate, indicate in, this, in the effort to educate the town council members who drafted the memo concerning racism. This is what is meant by systemic racism. This is why black families and people of color find themselves in a hole from which they cannot simply pull themselves out of by changing their family structure. We know as well that quality education, another pathway to wealth, has been systemically denied black America in insidious ways. The Military Times has documented the ways in which the GI Bill laid the foundation for benefits that would help generations of veterans achieve social mobility. More than two million veterans flocked to college campuses throughout the country. But even as former service members entered college, not all of them accessed the bill's benefits in the same way. That's because white Southern politicians designed the distribution of benefits under the GI Bill to uphold their segregationist beliefs. And her uh, email has hot links to the research. So while, the vet so while white veterans got into college with relative ease, black service members faced limited options and outright denial in the pursuit for educational advancement. This was not that long ago. It was within many of our parents' generation. To say that was then and now is different dismisses the reality that the impact of such uneven access to education reverberates even today for black America. No one is saying because you are white you are racist. Rather, the spirit of Coventry's resolution on racism is a public acknowledgement that practices put in place by a largely white America have disadvantaged people of color in lasting ways, and that Coventry will be on the watch to ensure that such often invisible measures have no place in governance, in employment, in education, in access to leisure activities. And that's uh, from Kathy Seventeen on Landers Road. And I, I just want to thank both of them for writing in and, and providing background and expressing their opinion. Any other members have anything to report? John? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first and foremost, I do want to um, extend my condolences to Harvey Barrett's family and friends on their, on their loss. Uh, clearly, Harvey was a member of our community who cared about our town, poured himself into it in many ways, and was not afraid to speak up for Coventry. So, um, anyway, there's that. Uh, attended the JDM Imports Grand Opening. It is a, a, a vibrant and electric atmosphere there with 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 the vehicles there. There's a, the, it just. The style of them brings a fun thing to that area of the village that's been, uh, you know, it's been vacant for a little while and, and uh, it's, it's a good thing. It's good energy and they're bringing people from all over to come look at their wares. It's, it's, it's pretty neat. So that was, that was a nice event and great people running it there. They seem really nice. Uh, I would like to express my support for a, a re-examination of the, uh, our process for compliance enforcement. Um, again, not about any one specific thing, but about <coughs> the fact that it does seem to be just complaint based. I think maybe it's time to review that and see if there isn't a better way that we can do it that uh, doesn't pit neighbors against neighbors. Um, that's the most succinct way I can put it. Uh, that's all I have for this for my report. Okay. Oh, I have one more. I'm sorry. There was a letter sent in that I would like to read as well. It was sent by Jasmine Wolf, and it goes like this. I am very grateful that Coventry has passed an honest and meaningful resolution on racism. Thank you for your excellent work. I am also alarmed by some of the things that were said in Matt O'Brien Sr.'s commentary. 
Before George Floyd's murder, I thought I understood racism fairly well. When I was 20, I lived in a New York City racially mixed, poverty-stricken neighborhood. Our kitchen sank, ran, only ran hot water, our bathtub only cold water, and we flushed our toilet with a bucket. One morning, I woke to see the ceiling starting to fall on us. My ex-husband and I got out of the way just before three square feet of the cement ceiling crashed onto our bed. After that, if it snowed or rained outside, it did the same inside. The building was not safe. Legal aid told residents not to pay rent until the landowner fixed these serious problems. A few months later, he signed an agreement and immediately told the tenants to pay their back rent or be out of the building in two days. He never fixed the building. Legal aid closed the case. The college students who lived there were lucky. We knew we would get out of that neighborhood. For other families, there was no education, no jobs with decent salaries, no good food, no safe child care, and hospitals treated them horribly. These people had no hope. It is far easier to blame people for their poverty than to examine how we have contributed to the poverty and racism in this country as a society and as individuals. After George Floyd's death, I had to look at my unintentional contributions to racism, hatred, and keeping people in poverty. Our country does have a problem with prejudice. In 2020, the Southern Poverty Law Center documented 838 hate groups in this country, six of them in Connecticut. Soon after George Floyd's death, I heard two young women use the same words, one on public TV, news hour, and the other spoke to participants in Coventry's Black Lives Matter March. Both said, I have finished my education. I have my postgraduate degree. I'm ready to work but the employers don't want me. Coventry has its own shadow of racism. In the early 1990s, a single black mother moved into our neighborhood. The boy was racially bullied in Coventry High School. He told me that John Elsesser and the staff were trying to help him, but couldn't. His mother got a second job so she could afford to send him to another school. They soon moved away. A few years later, a white girl in our neighborhood was bullied at Coventry High. The town covered costs and transferred her to another school. I know what I'm writing is true, but I don't know more details. Did Coventry High intend to send him to another school? Did his family move too quickly? Did the school policy for bullied students change in between these incidents? Another incident, my husband and I were driving home on an exceptionally cold and windy day. A black high school age girl was walking home rather than taking the school bus. We offered her a ride and she accepted. We didn't ask her why she was walking, but we fear she was being bullied on the bus. In the past 20 years, five students of color in our neighborhood have gone to Coventry High, and I have never heard any complaints about their black children being treated differently. I was close to both families and I would have heard about it. Nonetheless, even the most well-meaning person or institution may say or do something painfully racist. We may think we know the experiences of people of color, but we really don't. Jesus always told people to share what they have, to give to the poor. When programs get cut in this country, they are often taken away from the poor while rich corporations get additional tax breaks or don't pay taxes at all. Welfare helps people of all races who have worked all their lives but didn't earn enough to save money for their old age. Yes, some people, whites included, are lazy and take advantage of welfare. For most recipients, it is a lifeline. Many people on welfare struggle to find a job and support themselves, to pay taxes rather than depend on welfare. People who have been suppressed should not be blamed or denied the help they need because some sleazy people take advantage of the system. Peace. Jasmine Wolf, 653 Flanders Road, Coventry. Any other council members have anything to report this evening? Richard? I just wanted to express my condolences to the barracks. Tari and his family. Um, I have great memories of working with Harvey on a lot of different projects and, and recently going to his house with um, some other friends of his. And he always was a ray of sunshine on a cloudy day. And um, I'm going to miss him. And he's a great guy, has been a great compass for this town. And that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. 
Um, do you have anything new to add about our election day polling questions? No, we just distributed the information that finance reviewed. I think a lot of the questions were were answered. Mm -hmm. The big takeaways: uh, people want pop-up tents. They should. Uh, Fill out, uh, a fill out a request. facilities report for the Board of Ed because it's their school and um, the, the signs cannot be embedded into the ground but uh, probably an umbrella stands okay because it's not embedded. Uh, so those were kind of the big takeaways. I'm, I'm going to cover a little bit in the okay, report you. as well. So. so now we have Finance Committee report. Matt O'Brien Sr. This is the report of the October 12th meeting. Um, is it okay, Mike? Uh, Amanda Backhouse Finance Director reported that we are slightly ahead of last year for revenue questions and expenditures are slightly above last year at this time. Board of Education expenditures are also slightly higher than th this time last year. We discussed the request from our finance director related to the IT switch replacement and the committee recommends that the town council authorize spending up to $24,000 from CNREF to replace the IT switch. The chair reviewed the questions that had been sent to the chairman of the Board of Education Finance Chair, uh, excuse me, Finance Committee should say, chairman to, to Chairman Bill Oros at committee. Related to the way the board reports its monthly financial position to the town council and said he asked for an informal meeting to discuss them. The committee discussed possible uses for American Rescue Plan Act funds that the chairman has proposed and the committee is considering. John provided a draft of a grant application for cultural art and arts organizations to use to apply for funding. The committee recommended some changes including making the maximum amount that could be applied for to be $5,000 and recommended establishing a time frame for applications and also the possibility of letting an organization make a request for an expedited review and decision if their circumstances warranted. It was agreed that the committee that would make the grant awards would determine the appropriateness of such requests. The committee recommends that we move forward with this grant offering as soon as possible once the agreed upon changes were made to the grant application. Next, the chairman presented his draft proposal to provide premium payments to emergency responders. The chairman proposed utilizing about 1.5% of the ARP funds, which totaled just over $55,000, but indicated there may be a need to add some additional funding for part-time dispatchers who were not included in his proposal. The chairman provided his rationale for the methodology he used to generate the proposal, and the <coughs> committee recommends that the town council move forward with this proposal including any modest modifications slash additions that Amanda Backhouse may make to it before the council meeting. The committee discussed the proposed construction of the pavilion at Laidwa Park. The cost for the project came in higher than were originally projected. Amanda Backhouse presented a memo outlining the options going forward. One option would be for the, I say them, it should be the soccer league to scale back and install a 24 foot by 24 foot pavilion rather than the 30 foot by 30 foot pavilion that the soccer league originally proposed, including some additional funds from capital funding reallocation that Amanda identified, there is enough funding available to pay for the smaller pavilion. The memo noted, excuse me, the memo detailed that in order to pay for the larger pavilion, there's a need for an additional $9,304. John Ossessor said that the soccer league was meeting on Thursday night. He said they had discussed the issue with the league and they believed that they could come up with additional funding. The chairman said he'd like to see them go forward with the 30 foot by 30 foot pavilion and that he thought the 24 foot by 24 foot pavilion would prove to be too small. The chairman asked the committee to make a recommendation to the town council that if the soccer league is not able to cover the entire remainder of the cost of the larger project, which they plan to determine on Thursday before the town council meeting, then the chair asked that the finance committee recommend that the town council authorize up to an additional $5,000 from CNREF as a, it should say, as, a, as an additional match. Sorry. From CNREF to ensure the project would go, to, uh, go forward. If the soccer league is able to provide the necessary funding, then this motion, motion would not be needed on, at Monday's town council meeting. Committee agreed, and that is our recommendation to the town council. John Assessor provided information that he received from the attorney Richard Roberts about the questions that were raised at the last town council meeting um, about the use of pop-up tents and signs outside of the designated 75-foot restricted area around the election polling places. 
Attorney Roberts said that some other towns also have policies that allow signs to be held but not stuck in the ground or leave them unattended. He said that this policy preserves the, po the, the policy against posting political signs on town property while allowing political speech. Attorney Roberts confirmed that moderators only have control of the polling place and the 75-foot restricted area around that polling place, except in specific <coughs> cases of behavior that impact people within the 75-foot area. He said that whoever has, this is the attorney Robert, said that whoever has jurisdiction over the property, in this case, in the case of the upcoming election, that would be the schools, would control behavior beyond the 75-foot area. John Alcesa reported that the superintendent of schools said that one would need to just fill out a facility use application and once approved would then be permitted to use a pop-up tent on school grounds. The chairman was pleased to get the information and finally settle what rules actually apply beyond the 75-foot um, designated area and determining the necessary mechanisms to allow parties to apply for the use of the property. And that's all respectfully, Matthew O'Brien Sr. Chairman of the Council, I mean of the Finance Committee. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for Matt O'Brien Sr.? There's no items on the agenda. <laughs> All right. Lisa Thomas, you wanted to remove the steering committee from our consent agenda? Yes, thank you. Um, so some time ago, I had brought up the issue of loss of services at local hospitals, and it's gotten worse since then. Um, so, um, Stafford Springs Johnson Memorial Hospital is moving forward with a request to its, it is beginning to eliminate their ICU and um, labor and delivery services. Rockville General has, as I mentioned, has done the same, and Wyndham Hospital has done the same. Um, Wyndham Hospital, there's a certificate of need hearing on November 10th regarding those actions, uh, and I had talked about our council making, potentially making some kind of statement that could be submitted as, as testimony um, to reflect our concerns. You know, as I was listening tonight um, about the amazing rescue by our, our emergency responders and the fact that she was taken by ambulance to Wyndham Hospital and then life starred to Children's Hospital. Now, it might be that her family would have made the choice to go to Children's, but she couldn't stay at Wyndham. There's no intensive care unit. Like they, I, I spoke, I've <coughs> spoken with several of the doctors there now. I spoke with um, one of the general surgeons who said to me, they have to make a decision before every single surgery. And if they feel there's any chance that that patient is gonna need intensive care unit, or intensive care, they ship the patient out. Um, so I, I, I drafted and attempted a resolution um, so that we could try to get the process moving. I wasn't here at any of either of the September meetings, so I couldn't be here to be a nag about it, and I feel like it's, it's in steering, but um, I did put this together. I'll read it a lot, and I brought copies, um, and it would say something like this. Be, be, before you do, yeah. can I just ask a question? Um, do you, you said they have a CON on November 10th. Is that yes. a hearing on the CON? Yes, oh, it's, it's a hearing. Hearing. Public public hearing. Okay. And, um, it's open to public comment. People can do it that day. People can submit written testimony. People can be the, at the hearing. The CN has the, appli the application, that's why I was, you said they had a CON. I just it's wanted a, to make it, it yes, clear a that there's a hearing on, on. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the services are not being provided right now. Those services aren't being provided. Right. Um, they can't staff it either. Which is another yeah, issue again, so. altogether. Um, and there's, there's as I said, I've spoken at length with both the general surgeon and with one of the few OBGYN docs who practices there to try to understand better. And it's a complex um, story, and you can hear it from different people and hear it in different ways, but the bottom line is, how is it impacting the people we, we represent, and what are we going to do about it? So this, this resolution would say something along the lines of, Whereas ever since Hartford HealthCare took over Wyndham Hospital, area residents have seen a shift to send patients out of the community to Norwich or Hartford for care. And whereas Hartford HealthCare eliminated the intensive care unit at Wyndham Hospital and has now terminated labor and delivery services at Wyndham Hospital as well. And whereas both Rockville General Hospital and Johnson Memorial Hospital, Stafford Springs, have also terminated their ICU and labor and delivery services, creating a maternal healthcare desert in Northeastern Connecticut. 
And whereas the Wyndham area has more high-risk maternity <coughs> patients than the state average and is already in a medically underserved area, and whereas many Wyndham area families do not have access to reliable transportation to get to and from Hartford or Norwich, exposing women in labor to more expensive ambulance rides and keeping families from accompanying them and from visiting them post-birth, and whereas Hartford HealthCare's termination of ICU and labor and delivery services at Wyndham Community Hospital has a disparate impact on the communities it serves, and whereas Coventry residents are directly impacted by these closures of services, especially our most at-risk families, and whereas a certificate of need hearing on the termination of labor and delivery services at Wyndham Community Hospital is scheduled for November 10, 2021, now, therefore, be it resolved that the Coventry Town Council demands that Wyndham Hospital restore intensive care and maternity services of labor and delivery to its original levels and develop integrated services with a community needs assessment informed by meaningful and diverse community input and resolve that the town Coventry Town Council enters this resolution as testimony to the certificate of need hearing on November 10th, 2021. So that's my stab at it. Um, is this similar to the, I know some other towns have made or similar. Uh, so Wyndham did a resolution um, that's very specific to, to Wyndham Hospital, and I, I used some of that um, to help me write this. I it's wanted, really Thank you. Thanks. Um, I just wanted it to be a little bit broader okay. um, because it's not just Wyndham Hospital, but it's Wyndham Hospital that has a certificate of need, but I think this additional information enhances our understanding. Um, and Mansfield, um, also, their human services, one of their departments wrote um, a letter that was endorsed, then endorsed by the town council. So um, there are places taking action. I don't, you know, I don't know if you want this to go to, this should go to steering first and then come back to us at our next meeting. We um, talked about it at steering. My initial thought is just everybody can digest this if you email it to those or yes. have John email it. And um, I think we could take it up on November 1st, and that should allow enough time for it to get to the. I think it would be great if it could go before to the, to the November 10th hearing. Right. Of this. That, I, that's mm -hmm. the goal? Is, is, yeah. yeah, this is great. Know, I don't think. So, you know, Sharon Hospital in the far western part of the state now is doing the same thing, so we have <laughs> continued eating away of the edges of our state, and we live in one of those edges. Quite a conundrum, right? Well, if it's solving, it's going to be another issue. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. The, the problem has to be solved, but I don't mind making the you know right. recommendation. It is complicated. Um, I, I, it's definitely the byproduct of some larger things that are going on in healthcare, um, where we're really losing sight of community-based care. And. Well, some of it's government incentives and the way that they build those, and you know, there's a lot, a lot of pieces, pieces, you know. So, mm -hmm. yep. so you want this in the next council agenda then, or, or do you want steering to talk about it, um, Julie, no. or are you good? I'd be good with going just so back to the you, full you can attest to the facts in here. That's the only thing that I would ask. Yeah, you know, I mean, so. and people can digest it and take a look. I mean, there aren't a lot of facts, but. Well, no, you, you say that they've eliminated services. And oh, I just want yeah, they're, they're, they're I just absolutely know that they're actually there. eliminated, not just not <laughs> providing them or something. You know, that's no. different. You know. Well, services are terminated. They're not providing labor and delivery. They're not providing an ICU. So I'm, I'm not, yeah, no, I'm not trying to be specific, yep. but no, the difference no. between it, if they actually say we're, we've eliminated service, they have to go through the process to do that. Which is the concern here. They're, they need to do the process. So that's what, so I'm just this this certificate of need hearing had to be forced. I'm just saying that you can back up the yeah. And there are factual statements in there, mm -hmm. so yep. that's all I'm asking. And and if there are ones that you yeah, I'll, I'll make some calls. I can know I, I, I know the presidents and yeah. CFOs, so I can call. So. Um, and maybe I can get some better you know, some additional information for yeah. you too. Yeah. Good. All right, John, you have something quick on Cobra for us? Thank you. Um, nothing you heard of the. I can't wait. <laughs> Good uh, call. The projects are going. Okay. Well, thank you. And how about your project update for the um, You you have it. I just want to really say that of all the things that are within it, um, they're paving Trowbridge, Carpenter, and South River uh, tomorrow. Uh, they're supposed to go up there to cut the keyways, mm -hmm. um, and. We're hoping to sign a contract for Swamp and uh, Route 44 by the end of the month. And 
finished up the archaeological dig for the sidewalks on Main Street, uh, waiting for the results, but uh, we begged to get the archaeologists uh, moving quickly so that we could keep moving, and they, they did. They were out uh, working on it last Friday. So I saw them out there um, yesterday, I think, too. Yeah, they, they were really they trying to get it done. So begging sometimes is a good strategy. Uh, so um, anyway, I'll, I'll stop there unless there are questions. Anybody have questions for John? So it's not important, but or not issue. But, uh, has there been any complaints about the chip seal? I know that we had prior no. to. That's what I was wondering. So I, I thought think it was we, done I very think well. I think we finished up the sweeping on, on Friday. I, I didn't check today, but they were supposed to finish it up. And we're tr going to try to do something we haven't done called the fog seal, which just like sells it in a little bit more, makes it a little darker color, but it's it's kind of like a seal over that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're having a hard time with it, uh, getting it scheduled, but we think we're going to get it. Uh, so we'd like to try it. You know, it's not overly expensive, but we understand that it helps settle it in, but more importantly, it extends it out. Mm -hmm. So okay. yeah, we want to try it just on the, kind of these rows right here so we can watch it and, and before we add it to our a little experiment, see how it works. Mm -hmm. okay. COVID-19 update? Uh, no news from OSHA. Um, um, that's the thing we're really waiting on, how it impacts our employees. Our health district is gearing up towards um, student vaccines and, uh, um, and uh, second doses. So they actually already held a second dose for, for uh, a lot of our uh, emergency people, and uh, while they're there, they're also opening up to a flu clinic. Uh, for Maybe you should call else. it the booster. Booster, yeah. Because <laughs> some people had one Johnson, some people right. had two Moderna, two yep. Pfizer's, so now it's a booster. The yeah, booster they're not they're really blending all, they're allowing they're the mix and match yet. yet but so the, now Johnson & Johnson is actually saying, well, we were always going to be a two-dose. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a little hard to believe that they're one, one shot. One and done. Yeah. But I thought if I understand too, our numbers in Tolland County are finally come down a bit. Did I not uh, report Yeah, they have been trending down. Right. Bit, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, we kind of do a little bit of this, but the overall trend of while we're doing this is, is still down. Right. But we had no new cases. There was something that, no, I can't um, recall what I read. So no more hospital No, it was, it was the same level of new cases. I think it was six, right? Yeah. In the latest 20, report, I mean, our town, our town as a whole, we're kind of the second or third worst in, in, that, in, that, in, in that, the that, health, that, district. health district. Health district. But there still remains one hospitalization in Town County. So, uh, so um, you know, there's not an over exuberance of uh, people going out to get uh, vaccinated. But and then uh, we have the age group thing. Not to jump in, but I think that's that's the thing that always jumps out as me is the it's 18 to 25 segment is doing poorly. 52% or something. Right? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, half of them are doing good. <laughs> yeah. Half, half's, uh, not, half's not a good enough number to our achieve older, it. Our older trying groups to achieve. are doing very well. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Next, Connecticut Regional Long-Term Recovery Project Overview. Uh, I just wanted to share information. There's a, a lot, and we That's are. That's what made our packet very big. Uh, well, it's actually I shouldn't give you the foundation <laughs> stuff, but uh, so our four town group uh, put together a, a little uh, economic development strategy. Uh, they've been working hard, and uh, we'll see whether we get any money or not. But we put together a little. They put together a little application to hire some consultants to keep keep the effort going. Um, and we. For staff that committee, we had asked that they report to us on a regular basis. I've never heard from anybody on that committee ever. Uh, some of their reports are in your quarterly reports uh, on the planning department, but we can, you know, again, we can... I just don't, I wasn't aware, um, until I got this, I didn't even know that what they were working on. Honestly, I, you know, I haven't really... Been. Anyway. Um, uh, I, I'll check, but I believe that a lot of their stuff is in the planners uh, quarterly reports, but we can make it more specific because okay. uh, things get lost in, in, uh, yeah. in, in volume, and, uh, but we certainly can do that. Thank you. Um, Next will be crumbling foundations report. Yeah, um, I, I'm waiting for the minutes. Uh, in my 
Friday kind of therapy session where I send you what happened for the week. Mm -hmm. uh, that um, it, it's amazing. <laughs> I just have to tell you, listening to what happened, because the group, the coordinating group, really hadn't met for two years because of COVID. So to hear what really get the data of what happened. So I'm waiting for the minutes and the, and the PowerPoint presentation slides, but I give you some highlights of how many how many people have been done, how much money is is still available, and and you know right now it looks like it's going to cover the existing need. We know the need is broader, much broader than that, because a lot of people still haven't come forward. But um, but you know there's hope, and uh, given what happened, uh, you know when this started emerging, uh, it was hopeless. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I just sit back and say, this shows what people can, working together, working with government, working with, at all levels, local, state, federal, uh, a lot of credit for a lot of people, what can happen to solve problems when we really want to? Uh, and this is an, a reinvestment in our economy uh, more than anything else. If, if this hadn't have happened, uh, the impact would have been desolation. I mean, the broadness of, of this. So, anyways, I'll get to the data, I'll stop there, but it was really uh, kind of like just feeling good that this group of people that have gotten together and really worked on coming up with a solution that's going to take, take us through this dark period. It's going to take a while, but knowing that it's coming is, is just key. Awesome. All right, next on our agenda, we had included in our packet a Coventry Senior Center Veterans Day tribute on Wednesday, November 10th, 2021. Do you want to hold it up, John, and talk about it a little? <laughs> yeah, the, they always have a, 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 good, uh, a, a good presentation there. Uh, Manny Rodriguez uh, goes through some, you know, reminds you of the ceremony and meanings of things. Uh, so. Um, John always speaks very well. Uh, <laughs> no pressure. Am I understanding correctly, though, that this year they're limiting attendance to families and better, to veterans and their families? Yeah, I mean, they have yeah. to keep it small. No, that makes sense. So, so they I are started trying. to put it in my calendar. I was like, I can really yeah. go this time. <laughs> <laughs> so, then, uh, so we, if you're interested, I'm sure we can try to get some some people in. But um, I don't want to push it. I don't want them to. Um, they're, the senior center is really slowly uh, coming back alive uh, and we don't want to push too fast but we also didn't want to miss this okay thank you john hand you wanted to remove and talk about the retirement of our tax collector linda greenbacker yes yes i did i just want to acknowledge her many years of service uh 28 years i think it says in here um and and uh, you know she's been a, a fixture there not, not only, as the tax collector, uh, what, for one, I have to make a comment about her last name. It's just so apropos. It's just so fitting. I don't know how we're going to replace that. <laughs> and um, no, but definitely very capable there. It's always been a, a professional operation there. It's, it's, I don't think you, you know, like many of the jobs in government, you might not necessarily see people on their best day or at their happiest when they're going to pay their taxes. So, so there's all of those slings and arrows that, that you know, that have to deal with over there. But, so I just want to acknowledge, because I, I didn't want us to just see it on the agenda and, you know, buried in there. When somebody's here that long, we want to acknowledge and thank them for their long service to the town. Agreed. So thank you, Linda. Of course, our forester is Michelle Woods. <laughs> oh, okay, so we have a contender. Thank you. Excellent. Is John hiring? Is John hiring these people? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd be totally stumped. All right, on to unfinished <laughs> business. <laughs> Not ready for action. Uh, Couldn't see the forest for the trees. New business. Oh. 8A 21 slash 22 dash 25. Consideration possible action. Authorization to spend up to eleven thousand seven hundred ninety five dollars from capital non recurring fund for steep grant match. Matt Senior. I uh, move to authorize the expenditure of up to eleven thousand seven hundred ninety five dollars from CNREF for the steep grant match. This, Second. Is, this has to do with the landfill. Thank you. 
Any discussion or questions? All those in favor, please say aye. Okay. Aye. Aye. Thank aye, you. Bob. Unanimous, thank you. 8B 21 slash 22 dash 26, consideration possible action authorization to spend up to 24,000. It's not supposed to be 9999, right? I thought we had discussed 24,000. That's what it said in your report. That's what it was, though. In your report, it said 24,000. The quote. Oh, yeah. It says 24,000 even. Yeah. yeah, that's what it says in my um, agenda as well. So. Yeah. So we'll, we'll make that 24. What, do I have an old agenda again? No, no, no. no, no. The agenda for finance. Okay. All right, go ahead, Matt. I move to uh, uh, authorize the expenditure of up to $24,000 from CNREF to replace the town hall IT equipment. Isn't Second. It, okay. Isn't it just a switch? or uh, We'll just call it IT equipment. That's fine. All right. John. The intention is to switch, yes. Okay. All right. Any questions or discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Unanimous. Next item of new business, 8C21-22-27. I'm sorry, let me back up real quick before you go. We're still discussing this with the insurance company, so the up to is might be very important this time mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we're hoping that we're going to get some of that. Yeah, this would have been the lightning strike. Yeah. 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 This is just to make sure it gets done quickly, and then mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I should have been wait. To. Uh, uh, yeah, like, things are like work and then don't work. Uh, yeah. So anyway, I just want to let you know we're hoping to, that insurance will cover more than that, uh, more yeah. than more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. Okay. Item twenty one slash twenty two dash twenty seven consideration possible action assignment <coughs> of American Rescue Plan funding. We discussed two different items at finance. You want to. Talk about them, Matt, or make a motion. Cool. So the first one I was going to talk about was isn't this the first one on the agenda? Premium pay. Premium, Premium pay, pay for emergency, emergency responders. responders. Correct. Correct. It's on there. Um, so it, it's kind of late, so I'm going to go quick. But did everyone actually get a chance to look at the documents that came along with this? Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I kind of laid out the methodology that I used to come up with, you know, the, the numbers that I used. But Amanda has made some minor adjustments as I had said that in my uh, report because we did not include the part-time dispatchers originally. So she has made allocations for them as well. So the total has gone up just a little bit. So, um, you know, it, as far as I would just authorize, so I moved that we, <laughs> let's do it this there way. I, I moved that the town council authorized the expenditure of um, funds from ARP equal to the amounts um, detailed on the draft of use of ARP fund, uh, I mean document that Amanda has adjusted. So for the top part of this, which was the town and police, was 32,900, and for the fire departments, 25,300. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Go ahead. I'm, I'm just very happy that we're doing this. Um, I think everyone, you know, um, really appreciates all that's been done during the pandemic and every day, you know, by all of these people. These are our emergency responders, really. And I, you know, I, I'm happy that we're including, you know, John and Amanda and Laura, uh, Chief Palmer and his um, executive assistant as well. I think all these people have gone above and beyond, you know, and, and I'm happy that we're able to do this for them. Agreed. Agreed. Everybody in favor of item number one, please say aye. 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 Unanimous. Okay, Matt Senior. Well, it's kind of in favor of the motion that we made, right? But <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, item number two. So um, there's two things that we need to do. One, we need to formally allocate a, a, a number, you know, the up to number from ARP funding, which we've we've been carrying as one percent, which I'm going to put in my motion. But I just want people to realize that I don't think we ever made a motion to to you know formalize that, and then um, also to accept the. Uh, grant fund application, excuse me, the grant application that's been developed. And we talked about at finance just a few of the little rules, you know, that we would utilize to make this work um, expeditiously. I also talked to David Hayes, who he said, we're, we're actually in good shape now, so we'll go through the regular process. We don't need to ask for an expedited process, which is kind of good, so. Um, but anyway, so I would, I would move that the town council authorize expenditure of up to 1% of ARP funding to go to culture and arts organizations 
and to approve the grant application that has been created by staff to for that purpose. Second, please. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion or questions? All those in favor of item number two, one percent for cultural art grants and the grant application that's prepared for people to use, please say aye. 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 I did say aye. up two, so just for me. <laughs> Up to one percent. Yeah, we're setting aside one percent, but right. it, it's you know. <laughs> okay. All right. Next item: a new business, eight D twenty one slash twenty two dash twenty eight. Consideration and possible action: funding for a pavilion at Laidlaw Park. I would need a report on how soccer did. Uh, postpone the meeting till tomorrow. Oh, give me a break. That doesn't help. Uh, <laughs> to continue this item? No, no. Uh, no, we need to uh, maybe leave off the second part of it, or, or do it and. Uh, well, so it, it, it's a it's a contingent yes. anyway yes. on you know whether, yeah. but but I just don't want to discourage they, them they from just coming forward they with funds. They could get a quorum. This was not an intentional. So. <laughs> I mean, you're, why don't you share what you had heard before? that you brought to our meeting, you know, yeah. as to what they thought they would be able to do. There's discussion, but, but they haven't had, you know, there's been kind of the informal exchange and stuff, and, and they're on, on the table for discussion purposes, they're looking at maybe trying to get 15,000. The, the issue is whether everyone will agree to that and whether it's too much. Um, you know, clearly the, the five that uh, you, you challenged, Grant, uh, uh, that was, uh, not an issue, but they're going to try to do more. Uh, so it's possible that they'll actually contribute the whole nine thousand three hundred and four dollars. And we have that laid out, right? Yeah, that's how yeah. we. Yeah, that's, that's how I sign. presented it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so it would only be like. This is like a backup contingency. The backup if they, they if they can't do this, but I, I think the discussion of finance was hopefully that they could do it, but understanding that it's not a vote to it's a vote. Mm -hmm. So um, if, if it's if you prefer, I think that we can still go forward with the, it's because it's contingent on um, the, them not right. being able to come forward with the with the total amount of funds necessary to complete the project. Is, so that, is, it, is that okay language? I'm, try, I'm trying to make everybody happy. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's that's right. Back into to it, right? So the first motion, there's two motions. One is the reallocation, which you need to, to move. Yeah. Those are projects that are closed out. Um, and. Um, so that so one's easy. That, I can, one, that one I think you can do it out. I'll move to authorize reallocation of the above listed capital project balances to be used towards the Lake Lock Park Pavilion project. Second. And this is the 9,000. No. Wrong. Nope. This is no, the no. 12, the 18,000. 18,000. 18,000. Total available allocation $18,021.70. Oh, uh, on the, if you look up above, it says 1822. Sorry. Got it. It's rounded there. This is the the words are right before the word that says motion. The part you just read. Sure, sure. <laughs> All right. Everybody in favor of the motion to reallocate capital project balances to be used for the laid law pavilion funding. Please say aye. 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 And, and just to be clear, these are funds from related capital projects that didn't require the total funding. Um, so I'm going to ask the council to authorize up to an additional $5,000 from CNRAF as a second match to Sucker's contributions to be used only in the event additional funding is needed. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Just to be clear, the, the purpose is, is really timing of where we are in the seasons. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if we wait, things may not get in the ground. Okay, everybody. And, and we want it to go forward. So. Mm -hmm. Everybody in favor of spending up to $5,000 from capital non-recurring funds in order to match the soccer's additional, contribution. additional contributions, please say aye. Uh, aye. aye. If, if it's aye. necessary. If it's <laughs> That's two motions. Sorry. Well, that was in the motion. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Item 8E21-22-29, Consideration Possible Action Resolution for 2021 Memorandum of Agreement and Authorization of Town Manager to Execute. 